Before we formally start, let us take a moment of silence and put ourselves in the presence of grace. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim وسلم دائما مجتمعنا هذا بسلم والأمن والتقدم في بلدنا هذا آمين يا رب العالمين ربنا لا تجيغ قلوبنا بعد جهلتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب ربنا إنك أنت الوهاب ربنا تنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار وصلى الله على خير خلقه سيدنا محمد وعلى عليه وصحبه وسلم سبحان ربك رب العزة ما يسيبون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين آمين يا رب العالمين In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you today to praise and worship you and give you thanks for all the things you continue to provide for ourselves and our families. Father, we humbly ask for forgiveness for all the times we have offended you. When we forget to acknowledge your presence in the image of our brothers and sisters, and for moments we fail to be good stewards of the blessings you have given us. Continue to guide and protect each one of us, Lord, that we may always walk in the light of your everlasting love and mercy. Grant us, Father, with your comfort in times of distress and with your strength in times of weakness. Bestow upon us your unending grace and healing that we may in turn become instruments of gentleness and compassion to others. We ask all this in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, with a prayer and the intercession of our Blessed Mother. Amen.
Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Government Best Practice Recognition 2020 with the theme Forum on E-Governance, Delivering Efficient Services to the People in the New Normal. I am Kate and I will be your host for this afternoon. The Government Best Practice Recognition, or GBPR, is now on its fifth year, and this year there were 10 recognized best practices out of 71 entries. Today, we are blessed to have with us an expert panel of presenters from the previous batches of recognized best practices in the country's public sector. Aside from that, we will be listening to three guest speakers who are highly esteemed in their fields of benchmarking, knowledge management, and e-governance. Of course, this event is brought to you by none other than the Development Academy of the Philippines. I know this is all very exciting for all of you. So without further ado, to formally open our forum for today, we have with us an extraordinary woman who has rallied the DAP to greater heights. Ladies and gentlemen, the Senior Vice President for Programs of the DAP, Ms. Magdalena L. Mendoza. Hello uh, to Assistant Secretary Clarito Alejandro Magsino of the Department of uh, Budget and Management. To Ms. Elena Avidilio Cruz, uh, knowledge management and benchmarking expert. To Dr. Robin Mann, director of the Center for Organizational Excellence Research of Macy University in New Zealand. To Ms. Abigail Garcia, head of the examiner's division of the Business Permits and Licensing Office, City Government of Muntinlupa to Attorney Melanie Soriano Malaya, Chief of the Business Permits and Licensing Office, uh, City Government of Paranaque, Attorney Raquel Loxim, the Officer in Charge of the UP Diliman Supply and Property Management Office, Assistant D Regional Director, Rosemary Salazar of the Department of Science and Technology, Region 9, our distinguished uh, attendees, uh, guests, ladies and uh, gentlemen, welcome to the Government Best Practice Recognition Forum for uh, 2020. Thank you for joining us in this online uh, knowledge sharing session. And I am so glad uh, to know that uh, this afternoon, uh, there will be presenters from the GPBR 2015, GBPR 2017, and GPBR uh, 2020. Indeed, the community of practice uh, for this government uh, best practice program has really uh, expanded. If not for the COVID-19 pandemic, we will surely be having a face-to-face -face forum where you can interact with all the presenters and our eminent uh, speakers and also have a more engaging exchange of views with our best practice implementers. But uh, that prevented us to do so. But one thing good no, that we found out uh, is that uh, if there's anything positive uh, about the pandemic is that uh, though it is not an intended uh, result, we have seen the first or a fast wave of digitization and the introduction of innovations uh, in many government uh, agencies to be able to deliver the essential public services to the public. Indeed, the public sector must learn from this crisis and maximize the opportunity to innovate more, to be able to imbibe the, the discipline of agile uh, response. We are now, as we understand, in the phase three of the national uh, action against or action plan against uh, COVID-19. And the focus of this uh, phase 
is to hasten the economic uh, recovery. Our economic managers emphasize that um, one of the priorities of the government is to be able to open the economy safely and uh, in part substantial uh, resources uh, were already earmarked to support uh, this opening of the economy. And on our part as public uh, sector, we need to gear up you know, to the new normal. So under the new normal, I would just like to emphasize uh, three things. Innovation, productivity, and agility should now form as part of our new work style. Innovation, productivity, and agility should now be part of the new business style. Innovation, productivity, and agility should now be part of our new uh, lifestyle. Thank you very much. And we hope that we will have a very productive sharing session this afternoon. Thank you very much, SVP Mendoza, for the warm welcome you have extended to our guests and speakers and for emphasizing the importance of innovation, agility, and productivity in the new normal. Now, you must be wondering who will be joining our panel of experts. To introduce the speakers for this afternoon, I would like to call on the Director of the Productivity and Quality Training Office, Ms. Maria Teresa Agustin. Good afternoon. So we have three resource persons for this best practice forum. So the first resource person is the Assistant Secretary to the Information and Communications Technology Management Group of the Department of Budget and Management. ASEC Toto, as he is known to many, is tasked to support the public financial management reforms of the department with the underlying technology and build its internal capacity to lead the government in systems and technology. He also currently serves as DBM's principal representative to the Government Quality Management Committee or GQMC. And be known to many, Asek Toto has already retired from public service in 2012. He spent more than two decades of his professional career at the Development Bank of the Philippines, where he was senior vice president and chief information officer. Since 2002, he was concurrently president and CEO of the DBP Data Center Incorporated, the bank's IT subsidiary until 2012. Upon his retirement, he headed a foundation of former government CIOs in their advocacy to promote e-governance and the efficient use of information and communications technology in government. He obtained his Master in Business Administration degree from the Ateneo Graduate School of Business Regis program and his Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from the University of the Philippines under a National Science Development Board Scholarship in 1981. He is a career executive service officer since 1995. While our second resource person, so our, our first resource person is no other than Assistant Secretary Clarito Alejandro Magzino. Okay. So our second resource person is the former Vice President of the Development Academy of the Philippines and Managing Director of the Center for Knowledge Management. She served as technical expert of the Asian Productivity Organization, or APO, on benchmarking and knowledge management, and also served as national coordinator for the Philippines in the APO Best Practice Network. She provided also technical inputs to the Compendium of PQA Recipients Best Practices, Volumes 1 and 2, and in the APO Compendium of Best Practice Case Studies in Asia, Volumes 1 to 3 in 2004 to 2007. And our third resource person 
So our, our second resource person, Ms. Elena Avedillo Cruz. The third resource person um, is Dr. Robin Mann. Founder, she, he's the founder and head of the Center for Organizational Excellence Research of Massey University in New Zealand. He's also the CEO of the Center for Organizational Excellence Research Limited, uh, which undertakes consultancy projects in business excellence and benchmarking and provides benchmarking training. He also serves as commercial director and founder of the BPIR.com Limited, which is the leading internet resource for sharing best practice and benchmarking information. He also serves as the chairman of the Global Benchmarking Network, which is a membership-based organization for those organizations that promote and support benchmarking within uh, their respective countries and currently has more than 20 countries represented in it. And he also served as honorary advisory board member at Hamden bin Mohammed E University in Dubai. Dr. Robin Mann um, has these following qualifications. He has obtained his doctorate degree in total quality management from the University of Liverpool in the United Kingdom and was able to be one of the first uh, who obtained the doctorate degree in total quality management in the world. He also obtained his Master of Science in Technology for Manufacture in the University of Warwick in the United Kingdom and Bachelor of Science in Management Sciences, University of Lancaster in the United Kingdom. He is also uh, serving as assessor in the United Kingdom's Quality Award for the EFQM criteria and for the New Zealand Business Excellence Foundation as Ex as examiner. He is also a lead assessor of quality systems. Dr. Robin Mann has uh, these areas of expertise in all areas of business excellence, both in the Baldrige and European business excellence model, TQM, quality management, performance measurement, best practices, and benchmarking. He's also serving as the technical expert of the Asian Productivity Organization on Business Excellence. He's appointed as chief expert for excellence for uh, the project to review the value and impact of business excellence in Asia, which focus on the study of five countries. And he also developed the world's first certification scheme for benchmarking to professionalize the benchmarking field. And he has also contributed to our development of the government best practice recognition. So those are our three um, distinguished resource persons for this afternoon's best practice forum. Assistant Secretary Clarito Alejandro Magsino, Ms. Elena Avedillo Cruz, and Dr. Robin Mann. Thank you very much, Director Agustin. Without a doubt, our speakers this afternoon are definitely top caliber and are experts in their own fields. As mentioned earlier, our first speaker for this afternoon is Assistant Secretary Clarito Magsino of the De uh, Department of Budget and Management. He will talk about e-governance in the Philippine public sector and afterwards, we will be opening the floor for a short Q&A. Should you have any questions during the presentation, kindly type them in the chat box and we will entertain your questions during the Q&A portion. Asik Magsino, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kate. I'll be sharing my screen. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Kate, Tess, and SVP Dede Mendoza for that uh, kind opportunity for me to address this forum, the GBPR Forum 2020. 
and impart to you my own insights on e-governance in the Philippine public sector and delivering efficient services to the people, especially now during the era of the new normal. For this afternoon, I'll be, I'll be discussing the following tap topics. First, a review of why we are in government. Then, what is e-governance? Third, process management in government. And lastly, success factors in moving towards e-governance. Why are we in government? We cannot talk about e-governance without first referring to accountable governance. And accountable governance refers to the collective responsibility of officials to preserve the public trust in government by delivering on policy outcomes and safeguarding taxpayer funds. Accountable governance involves systems and coordinated actions through which the public sector ensures the effectiveness efficiency, and economy of public expenditure. No less than the Philippine Constitution of 1987 explicitly declares that public office is a public trust. Public officers and employees must at all times be accountable to the people, serve them with utmost responsibility, integrity, loyalty, and efficiency act with patriotism and justice, and lead modest lives. The term public service begs the following questions. As public officials, who among the people are we accountable to? If those working in the government are called public servants, who then are their masters? To underscore to understand these concepts better, it would be good to cite a traditional Filipino custom called pamamanhikan, wherein a young bachelor visits the parents of his fiancée to express his intention to marry their daughter. I still clearly, clearly remember the first question my then future father-in-law asked me when I went to him to ask for her daughter's hand in marriage. Anong ipakakain mo sa anak ko? <laughs> or other, how will you feed my daughter? Or what will you feed my daughter? It then dawned on me that the primary objective of any social structure such as a family is to survive. Thus, my wife and I had to work hard to earn a living. Literally, earn to live. Mas malino to sa Tagalog. Maghanap buhay. We already realized early on that there are two roles to be played in that simple social structure that we started. While someone looks after the means of livelihood, someone else will have to look after keeping the house. That is cleaning, cooking, laundry, or housekeeping in general. As the family grew and needs became more complex, functions such as care for the aging parents, child rearing, health, education, transportation, domestic peace, and order had to be addressed as well. Thus, the role of and the need for additional household helpers became very obvious. It also became very clear, very clear who the masters are and who the servants are. As social structures grow, and become more complex, such as communities or provinces or even the country. These two general roles of looking after the means of livelihood and survival and housekeeping can still be observed. Those who are looking after the creation of wealth for the nation through manufacturing, agriculture, trading and import and export, tourism, and industries in general are those in the private sector. It then follows that the task of those in the public sector would be to look after their needs so that they can be more efficient, effective, competitive, and so that the country as a whole can become economically viable and wealthy. We, those in public office, are their servants. 
to look after their security, justice, peace and order, cleanliness in the environment, transportation, health, education, and all else. At saan galing yung sinasweldo ng mga tumutulong sa atin sa bahay? Natural. Sa kinikita ni ate at ni kuya. And just as the operational needs and wages of the servants are paid for from the income that their masters generate, it also follows that the wages and funds needed by the public sector to carry out its functions are derived from the income of all taxpayers. They are those who create wealth for the country. It behooves the whole government, therefore, to have a system of accountability as far as our calling as public servants to the people and to the country is concerned. Kaya hindi lang basta-basta or just-just ang taong gobyerno. Each employee of the government has a certain unique quality. And it is this innate attitude to improve service delivery, to do more with less, to do more with the same resources, ensuring quality service at all times, providing ever-increasing value to the taxpayer's hard-earned money, and above all, serving with honesty, integrity, and transparency. Now let's take a look at e-governments and e-governance. E-governance is based on the intrinsic characteristic of ICT, like enabling similar access to data for everyone who is a part of a digital network and on netting all sources of information across the entire network. In, in e-governance, information is not retained in a particular node, but flows uniformly to all the nodes of the entire network. Thus, e-governance creates, as a consequence, an environment of all inclusiveness that allows citizens to participate actively in decision making and makes government action invisible, makes government action visible to the citizens as well. E-governance is an evolving and dynamic method of governance which advocates for better governments that are participative, transparent, and all-inclusive. Almost always, e-governance is characterized by the use of technology as an enabler. And these models of digital governments are still evolving in developing countries like the Philippines. Thus, e-governance will result to improving information delivery, making citizens participate in decision-making, and makes all government actions transparent, thus accountable to the people. Another way of defining e-governance, therefore, is the application of ICT in delivering government services. In exchange of information, communication transactions, and integration of various standalone systems and services. So you see, technology plays a very important role. E-government is the technology-based infrastructure of governments that makes citizens' engagement possible, provide higher productivity of governments in terms of reducing costs, more efficient administration, and delivery of ever-improving quality of services and better policy outcomes. In the pre-pandemic era, the productivity movement sought to achieve quantum leaps in achieving more with the same resources, if not less resources than before. Efforts to automate manual processes were prevalent throughout the government. The E-Commerce Act of 2000 spurred the government on to make use of the nascent World Wide Web to reach out to the citizenry by making their presence felt across the internet. Later on in 2007, we saw efforts in instilling a quality culture in government when efforts to streamline government processes by reducing red tape were mandated by the anti-red tape law. 
In that same year, President GMA issued E0605, mandating all agencies of government to at least be ISO 9001 certified, with emphasis on shifting focus from internal excellence to external client satisfaction and continual improvement to achieving delighting our customers, our citizens, in all our frontline services. Such was an urgent and important undertaking that it even became a prerequisite for agencies to be ISO certified for them to be entitled to the PDB. More recent developments that further guided us towards improving governance is the passing of the Ease of Doing Business and Efficient Government Service Delivery Act of 2018. For the first time, there is a mandate to look at government processes from a whole government standpoint. And speaking of the whole government, are you familiar with the story of the blind men and the elephant? You see, an Indian king ordered all the blind people to be assembled. And when they came, he ordered that all the elephants be shown to them. The blind men went to the stable and began to feel the elephants. One felt a leg, another a tail, a third the stump of the tail, a fourth the belly, a fifth a back, a sixth the ears, and a seventh the tusks, and the eighth a trunk. Then the king called the blind men and asked them, what do my elephants look like? One blind man said, your elephants are like posts because he felt the legs. Another blind man said, they're like bath brooms because he felt the end of the tail. A third said, they're like branches because he felt the tail stump. The one who touched the belly said, the elephants are just a clod of earth. The one who touched the side say, they are just a great wall. The one who touched the back said, they are, they are like a mound. The one who touched the ear said, they are like huge fans. The one who touched the tusks said, they are like horns. And the one who touched the trunk said, they are like a stout rope. And all the blind men began to dispute and to quarrel. And so these men of Hindustan disputed loud and long, each in his own opinion, exceeding stiff and strong. Though each, each was partly in the right, all of them were wrong. You see, all government agencies were created for one purpose only, that's with that which they call their mandate. Thus, it is incumbent upon all their employees to focus on that mandate and that mandate alone. This leads to the proverbial placing our faces too close to the tree that we tend to lose sight of the entire forest. Fortunately, the Anti-Red Tape Authority or ARTA has launched its flagship program in March this year that aims to reduce the time, cost, requirements, and procedures in sectors of economic and social significance, including logistics, by 52% within 52 weeks. ARTA named this Project Nehemiah, which stands for the National Effort for the Harmonization of Efficient Measures of Interrelated Agencies. Again, national effort for the harmonization of efficient measures of interrelated agencies. It is a sector-based streamlining effort that involves both capacity building with identified agencies and public hearings with stakeholders regarding existing and new regulations. These streamlining efforts involve processes that cut across multiple agencies of government in diverse, or similar sectors. The Project Nehemaya shall break down the silo system and the lack of interconnection among government agencies. Our government must be a singular unit serving the country with the citizens being our primary client. ARTA Director General Attorney Jeremiah Belhika said in a statement. Thus government processes are not viewed from the point of view of the actors in the process, 
which are most of the time composed of multiple agencies of government, but from the point of view of the public who sees all of them in action. Now that we are in the COVID era, there is this SONA Directive of 2020-007, which I refer to as the James Bond Directive, and which I wouldn't refer to as Mission Impossible, which directs the whole government to transition to e-governance in the next normal and make queuing a thing of the past. The president himself in this July 27, 2020 State of the Nation address instructed DILG, DBM, and ARTA to streamline all pertinent government processes and transactions to make these available online for the general public. Uh oh, I know what you're thinking. IT is the answer. And this is where I'd like to emphasize the primacy of process management over technology. More often than not, we are made to believe that technology is the answer. Get state-of-the-art equipment. That's the key to improving government service. Remember, buying the latest rec release of a DSLR does not make one a good photographer nor getting the best set of golf clubs will not guarantee that you can play side by side with Tiger Woods. Do you remember the first time the automated election took place in the country in 2010? We were all very excited to try out the Picos machines for the first time. We were all told that it will only take less than 15 minutes to complete the voting process. What we were not told is that it will take us more than three hours of waiting before it is your turn to cast your votes. No one took care of crowd control, nor the adequacy of space to accommodate all those who were so excited to try out the new machines for the first time. The prerequisite of an effective establishment of an e-governance system is business process re-engineering. BPR involves the radical redesign of core business processes to achieve dramatic improvements in productivity, cycle times, and quality. In BPR, companies normally start with a blank sheet of paper and rethink existing processes to deliver more value to their customers. They typically adopt a new value system that places increased emphasis on customer needs. Companies reduce organizational layers and eliminate unproductive activities in two key areas. First, they redesign functional, organization, functional organizations into cross-functional teams. Second, they use technology to improve data dissemination and decision making. The key is in breaking down information silos. You see, if only the blind men were able to share how they saw the elephants, they might just have figured out how the elephant looked like after all. Estonia is a very small country in Europe, yet known to be the most advanced in digital government. E-Estonia, which is their country's e-governance version, espouses that data or information already captured by an agency of government belongs to the entire government. They capture information once and they use it many times. Capture once, use many. Named the most advanced digital society in the world, Estonia has built an efficient, secure and transparent ecosystem where 99% of governmental services are online. Singapore is another example of a highly digitized society. Their mantra of government is, although we come from different agencies, we are but one government. BPR is a prerequisite of e-governance and considers the interplay of process, people, technology, and budget. 
Before the pandemic, reengineering was geared towards improving customer experience in the service delivery. We have Quartus frontliners, huge IDs with pictures and signatures, clean and comfortable facilities, semi-automated processes, self-service machines and kiosks, efficient, comfortable for both service providers and those being served, but it required physical presence. The pandemic brought about circumstances that demanded a different approach, need for the vulnerable sector to stay at home, and the need for those allowed to go outside to wear masks and shields, maintain physical distancing, and frequent hand washing. This has imposed restrictions in our movements and interactions. But look at how the private sector adapted to these circumstances. Online ordering systems, delivery systems, electronic funds transfer and payment systems, SM store as a single point of contact system that your personally assigned focal salesperson can do all the purchases from their store to you. Clothes, furniture, Christmas tree, lights and decor, cookware, carpentry tools, tablet, and even a cell phone. I know this. I've seen this all in my house. Let's take a look at the success factors then. One of the first things that are needed for us to be successful in our transformation towards e-governance is stakeholder buy-in. We need to properly identify who the process or the business owner is. I'll, I'll tell you a story about the baker and the bakery, okay? You see, central to the bakery as a business are the ovens. Therefore, the choice of the ovens are the most critical part of the decision to run a bakery business because that will determine what type of bread you're going to bake. Thus, a close collaboration between the baker and the oven manufacturer will have to be there from the very start. But it has to be very clear what your answer is to this question. Who runs the bakery? There are other needs of the bakery as a business, physical infrastructure, business permits and licenses, production, sales and marketing staff, and most importantly, the accountant. And these are not the concerns of the oven manufacturer. Nonetheless, we cannot overemphasize the need for a responsive technical support. Any move towards e-governance will have to have a very solid, efficient, and responsive technical support. Just as the ovens are central to a bakery business, the IT support team is crucial in a digital government. Then you have continuous improvement. Never lose sight of the mission of government to serve the public. A good and efficient government is an invisible government. Why? Because the only time the government is seen is when something is not doing right. Always try to do better each time. And this is where innovation, productivity, and agility comes to play. And lastly, we have risk management, documentation, and continuity. All governments, be it local or national, are subject to a cycle that coincides with an election year. May our level of service quality not wane every time there is a change in the administration. Our QMS and ISO certification collectively ensures continuity of the same level of standards, regardless, who, regardless of who performs the function, regardless of administrations. In closing, again, I'd like to emphasize, never lose sight of the big picture. Our role as public servants is to make this country great again by allowing those whose job it is to make this country wealthy to do their jobs well. Be creative, 
be innovative in serving them so that they can do so efficiently and in a worry-free manner. And by doing so, we make all our lives very comfortable as well. At the end of each day, always ask ourselves, are we true to our calling as civil servants? Before I end, I'd just like to convey my heartfelt congratulations to all those who were cited as GVPR recognized best practices from 2015 to 2020. Thank you, and may we all have a very Merry Christmas at Mabuhay po tayong lahat. Thank you, Asik Magsino, for the very enlightening talk. One of our audience commented that you're an excellent speaker, sir. Uh, that's my <laughs> next. Uh, <laughs> that's my next career. I'm looking for a radio program too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm sure that our audience were able to relate with the several examples and comparisons that you provided in the improvement of e-governance in the Philippines. I think my favorite is the comparison you provided between the blind men of Indistan and the creation of silos in government service. That was a good one. So before we start asking questions, some of our audience have a small favor to ask. Uh, would it be okay for the ASEC to show his handsome face to us? Okay lang ba, sir? <laughs> Ayun, I thought you'd then... never ask. <laughs> All right, so uh, we, we are now entertaining questions. If you have any questions, please type them in the chat box. And uh, let me also remind everyone that we're also accept, we're still accepting uh, submissions for GBPR um, best practice for COVID response until December 20 only. All right, any questions from the audience? Well, we still have uh, ASIC with us here. Actually, we are very grateful that you took time out of your busy schedule to join us here at the GBPR 2024. It's my pleasure, Kate, it's my pleasure. Okay, so no questions from the audience? I think uh, we still haven't received any questions. So um, going back on your presentation, sir, I also would like to, um, I, I think the analogies and comparisons that you provided were very um, relatable. I really, I also appreciate the, the slides because they're not too text heavy. It's easy to understand. <laughs> okay, we don't have a question, but we have a confirmation from Mr. Rene Alvarado. He says that uh, indeed government should never lose sight of the big picture and QMS and improvement should be maintained regardless of who is in the administration. Agree, sir. That's, thank you, thank you so much. And okay, so we have uh, someone here from NHA, Sir Antonio, Mer I think the, the name's cut, I think it's Mercado or Mercader? Mercader, Sir Antonio Mercader from NH NHA. He says, the succession plan was approved by the NHA management in October 2020. NHA identified 164 critical positions under the succession plan. For 2021, NHA will identify the potential successors for these critical positions. And NHA proposed that the formula for the 2021 would be number of high potential successors or HPS over the number of critical positions, okay, and NHA to provide a copy of the succession plan, including a briefer on the levels of the succession plan implementation and interventions to be implemented. All right, so thank you for sharing, Sir Antonio. 
I don't know how to comment on that, but perhaps <laughs> ASEC would like to comment on the sharing. Yeah, okay. Remember that governance always falls back to who are the ones performing the governments. So it really boils down to who are the people in the government, okay? And as we are moving towards a competency-based you know, uh, human resource, what we're looking at are the compatibility or the, the fit of those who are incumbents in the position and the qualifications of those positions. So one of the first things that any succession plan will have to see is preparing people for boxes with specific competencies, okay? And it's better to fill in those gaps before, before the actual person takes over or the actual person occupies the place, the, the boxes. Now, one of the things that is now coming out is technology is part of daily life already. Okay, there used to be a time when people are dependent on their secretaries to do everything for them, including checking their emails and attaching their digital signatures. Okay, <laughs> we will have to graduate from that. Okay, as we're moving to a more digitized world, people will have to take care of their own signatures. Okay, and that is another aspect of life that we'll have to accept as the new normal. So if, if you are not using to signing documents using your digital signature, then it's about time that you start learning, okay? And a little, a little thing about digital signatures. Remember that signatures go with the documents that they are, that they are attached to, okay? So a digital signature will have to be attached to a digital document. Okay, you cannot attach a digital signature to a paper document. Neither can you wet, can you attach your wet signature or sign your name with a pen and paper when a pen on a digital document. Okay, so one of the first policies that each agency of government will have to adopt is the recognition of digital documents as an actionable document to be accepted by everyone in the office. And I'll give you an example, okay? If you go to a bank and withdraw money, okay? This is in the analog, in the paper world. If you go to a bank and withdraw money, you don't go to the teller and give him or give her a piece of paper with your handwritten instruction to give you money from your account and then sign that piece of paper, okay? And you cannot tell the teller that, look, you have to accept this instruction because that's my signature there, okay? So it is not only the signature that is important, the form of the document is also important. So if we're talking about electronic documents and electronic signatures, therefore we'll have to agree that this type of electronic document is acceptable, okay? Well, another example, electronic tickets in the airport and electronic tickets in the movies, okay? So once you have purchased your electronic ticket, all you have to do is show an electronic copy of that document and you will already be issued your, you'll be already allowed to watch your movie or enter the plane, okay? So the medium is the electronic document. It is no longer the paper or the form. Unlike in the paper world, you have to, you have to conform to the form, okay? And this is something that's so simple and yet so difficult to do. Because this is where the, you know, the shift in, in, uh, in habits will have to come in. Okay, you'll have to learn how to create digital documents. You'll have to sign the digital document. You have to propagate and act on the digital document. And you'll have to archive that digital document. Okay, so when a case comes out in court, they will have to retrieve that digital document. 
because that is a document that you signed okay and that's a totally that's a total ecosystem that you'll have to you'll have to create for your agencies so unless there is a policy that says that kalaban yo ko okay yeah. <laughs> okay yeah i think this uh, this is also related to your answer about uh, conducting financial transactions uh, through e-services. So this this question is from MWSS, Ms. Jillian Manlangit. What okay. should the government do to entice the public to avail of e-services? There is feedback that availing of such services is more troublesome. Case in point is the implementation of cashless payment. Well, it's a reality that we'll have to face sooner or later. I remember before when the first ATMs, ATM machines came out, nobody wanted to transact with them. They didn't trust the machines, okay? But now it's almost second nature for everybody to, to use the ATM machines for their cash. They don't go to the banks anymore. Now, I agree that this thing will have to be further studied. I remember before when the first, when the e-commerce act of 2000 came out, there was this provision that says that within two years, all agencies of government should be able to have their services available in the internet. That's why there was a proliferation of websites from all over the country, each government agency coming up with its own front end uh, website. What was not, what was not taken into account is the technical support and the security needed by those websites, okay? And if you take a look at, even up to now, if you take a look at the <clears throat> civil service rules, there is nothing that speaks of 24 by seven operations, which is something that websites and web services will have to face, you know, because once you make yourself present in the World Wide Web, you are on, 24 by 7. You cannot place on your website, we are, okay, it's already 5 o'clock and we're closing down. And then you open it again at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. No, <laughs> okay? So it's something that operates 24 by 7 and therefore the civil service likewise will have to follow with policies governing 24 by 7 operations by civil servants, okay? So th those are my examples of looking at the big picture, okay? We cannot, we cannot allow the lawmakers to come up with laws in one, on the one hand and not support it with policies on the other. And this is where cashless payments come in as well. It is not a question of technology. If you notice, credit cards have been there since decades ago, okay? But how come we cannot even pay? government services using credit cards. Okay, so uh, I'll leave you with that question and uh, the answer will take another hour. So thank you, Asik. But that's but something that you'll have to think about, okay? It is not a question of technology. Most of the time, it is a question of policy, process, procedure, resources, okay? All and right, since, so, mm -hmm. since it cuts across the entire government, it's not something that can be solved by any one agency of government. Okay, so speaking of policy and processes, we have a question from the DAP uh, Senior Vice President, Ms. Mendoza. Uh, Secretary oh, no. Toto, yeah, yeah what very, is... Very difficult questions. <laughs> so... Speaking of policy, what is being done about the recognition of electronic signatures since nowadays we still need the wet signatures for accountability? Uh, what will allow us, the agencies, to fully realize contactless transactions with clients and within the government? Okay, first, first <clears throat> the issue of the issue of documents and signatures, that I already discussed earlier, there just has to be a policy allowing us to recognize to recognize and uh, and uh, consider as valid actionable documents digital documents as well may they be in pdf form email or uh, electronic instructions okay now once that policy is in place then uh, everybody will just have to follow 
Okay. And as I mentioned, one way of one way of validating or authorizing or authenticating uh, digital documents is by attaching a signature or an electronic signature. Now, for someone to be able to validate whether that electronic signature is valid or not, there normally is a third party authenticator or somebody who is a disinterested party, some sort of a notary public who will say that this person whose signature this is, you know, is, is the authentic owner of that signature and the, uh, and the attachment of that signature cannot be contested. And therefore, that document where that signature is attached is now actionable. Okay, in the Philippine government, that authority is the DICT. Okay, DICT issues a certificate authorizing the use of your digital signature. Okay, so it's just about, it's just for you to go to the DICT and, and register and be part of those who are allowed in the Philippine government to attach your signature in digital documents. Okay, I have so to know that PASIG accepts credit cards to pay for their services. Well, yeah, you know, thing. the problem with credit card kasi, is the merchant discount rate, okay? The one who actually shoulders the payment of the network is not the citizen, it is the government. Now, the problem with the government is that all expenses will have to be budgeted, allocated, and appropriated. So how can you at anticipate the amount of merchant discount rate that will be charged against the government every time somebody uses a credit card for payment? Now, the other issue there is accounting. Because normally the merchant discount rate is already removed even before the actual payment is done to the merchant. Kaya nga merchant discount, discounted na yung perang dumarating sa merchant. Now we'll have to, we'll have to you know, figure out this with COA because how will you now show that you already paid for the merchant discount rate when in fact you haven't even received the money yourself, okay? So those are those are policy issues that are still being worked on, and <clears throat> it can be done. So if the public, if the private sector was able to do it, I'm sure the government can as well. Okay. Thank you, sir. So just a follow-up question. So does that mean that since the ICT is now accepting uh, registrations for electronic signatures, will the COA soon accept? Electronic yes. signatures for yes, financial yes, transactions. Yes. As a matter of fact, COA, COA abides by you know, the rules set forth in the E-Commerce Act of 2000. All they're looking at is the adoption of the policy by government agencies. Okay. So if, if okay, for example, if Land Bank says that you cannot issue an LDAP ADA you know, in the form of a digital document, and the only thing that the, that the bank will accept are paper-based documents, then I'm sorry, COA will just have to accept it as that, okay? But if Land Bank all of a sudden says that, okay, now we're open to submission of, of, electronic, inf of electronic instructions for, for debit instructions, then COA will just have to abide by that as well. Thank you very much. That's Asik Magsino. Actually, we still have tons of questions in line, but uh, due to uh, the limited time that uh, we have, uh, that will be the last question that will be answered live. Don't worry, we will uh, email the questions to Asik Magsino and perhaps he can give us um, more enlightenment uh, as regards to your questions. We will email the answers. Uh, we will just send them by email blast. So sure, again, sure. yes, thank you again, Asik Magsino. We appreciate thank you, Kate. your presentation. Thank and you, Deb. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much, sir. So moving on to our next speaker, we actually have the former vice president and managing director of the Center for Knowledge Management. She is Miss Elena Avidilio Cruz, also fondly called Miss Lanlan. Lan. She will be discussing best practice sharing, a knowledge management approach. So, Ms. Lanlan, are you ready? Yes, 
Okay, I thought I was still uh, mute. Um, All right, we can hear you now. Okay, I need to share my screen. Okay, go ahead, Bob. Oh, okay. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am very honored to be one of the speakers for this uh, forum of the Government Best Practice uh, Recognition on e-governance, and I will be sharing with you uh, one of the knowledge management approach specific to best practice sharing. Okay. okay um, it's always a good way to start when you talk about best practice sharing, uh, specifically because later I will be going into one of the approaches, which is the community of practice, it's always a good way to start with the Philippine Quality Award Criteria for Performance Excellence Framework, which is also derived from the Baldrige, as you can see here. And uh, as shown here, there are seven criteria categories, and one of them is on knowledge management, specific to measurement analysis and knowledge management. And it's specific to that, uh, you have uh, one of the areas to address under the category is measurement analysis and knowledge management. Of course, it starts with measuring uh, what you think are the critical indicators, measures uh, of your organizational or, or your agency's performance, and then doing some analysis uh, leading to corrective action. And also uh, being able to come up with best practices for, for addressing this, uh, um, these issues and being able to share these best practices. So you see the sharing of best practices is actually under the Philippine Quality Award um, framework and specific to category four. Also, when we talk about our knowledge management, the APO or the Asian Productivity Organization uh, framework comes to mind because it tells you everything you need to know about knowledge management in an infograph. As you will see, um, it has concentric circles and in the middle or the center is your vision mission. It just tells us that you are not doing KM for KM's sake, but that you should be able to find how KM can help improve organizational performance. Where does KM come in? So it has to be aligned to your agency's vision and mission. And outside of that, you have the accelerators, also called the enablers or drivers, uh, important for us to be able to uh, facilitate the knowledge management uh, process. So you have leadership. Leadership has to set the direction, uh, spearhead the KM initiative, even role model the values of sharing and also collaboration. Then you have also people as another enabler. People are both users and generators of knowledge. And in some cases, uh, bright ideas, even innovation, breakthroughs come from people. And the third uh, enabler is uh, called processes. So there must be systematic processes in place. I'm sure you are very much aware of this already in your ISO 9001 QMS. So it is important so that they can be repeatable and replicable. And then you have technology, uh, especially now. Technology is very important, not only in storing knowledge, but also uh, not only in storing, preserving, retaining, but also very useful in sharing, as I will indicate later in, in the other slides. Okay, outside of that, uh, uh, these accelerators or enablers help us to um, do the knowledge process systematically. As you can see, uh, uh, the knowledge process starts with identify, then create, score, share, and apply. So you, you don't have to manage all your knowledge 
uh, you have to find out what is critical knowledge in your agency. Uh, mean, meaning to say that uh, what, um, what knowledge is, is critical to your operations. For example, if there are only a few people who have possession of this knowledge and they, they suddenly leave the organization, whether it's they retire or they um, resign or, is, or are redeployed, then who carries on? Who carries on the vital work of the agency? So it is very important that uh, we are able to identify what is critical knowledge. And then the knowledge that we don't have, but we need, then we need to uh, acquire. So this is knowledge acquisition. So we need to come up with uh, ways by which we can uh, create this coming from outside the agency, you get consultants or you uh, have your people go, go out for training or even within, you know, when you have such very good people who can, uh, you know, you can, who can come up with uh, very good uh, ideas, innovations, breakthroughs, then, then you do this part, the create, creation part. And then of course you store that knowledge, as I mentioned, retention, preservation, and uh, easy access uh, when you are able to uh, store this knowledge. And then especially when, when you do sharing, it's easier to share. And then the, 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 the loop actually has to uh, close with application. So we just uh, end it with sharing, knowing, oh, that's nice to know, nice to hear. These are good practices. These are best practices, but we don't do anything about it. We don't apply it. It's not, still not called man knowledge management because it did not in, uh, lead to actionable information. So it has to end uh, the close the loop with the application of that knowledge. And then of course, outside of that circle, we now have varying levels of outcomes. This uh, for us, as you keep turning the wheel of the knowledge process, we are able to do continuous learning, innovation, being able to capacitate not only individual, but also teams and people in the, within the organization and even outside the organization, as we all know, we in government need to take care of our so social outcomes, societal well-being. And the ultimate outcomes, of course, it should lead to an increase in productivity, quality, uh, growth, and of course, increasing profitability of our client organizations. Okay, so we said share is actually part of the KM framework under the knowledge process. And in particular, we're dealing with uh, regular and sustained exchange of knowledge. So there must be a way by which uh, there is that sharing that goes uh, within the organization. Uh, and then there's a culture. Sometimes some organizations start with nurturing or building and nurturing that culture of sharing and collaboration first and foremost. Also continuous learning uh, and use of technology. As we now know, uh, we can't do much face-to-face -face, if ever at all. And, uh, and, and because of the pandemic, it really actually accelerated the, the digital transformation. So we have to do more virtual uh, online type of sharing. And that leads us to community of practice because when you do best sharing practice, it's not only uh, using this forum, for example, this forum on uh, GBPR, Government Best Practice Forum, Information Forum, uh, where, whereby uh, different agencies are able to present their best practices. It can also happen within the agency. We do some uh, sharing as well, like for example, uh, you have a, a community of practice of executive assistants, or you have a community of practice if you are into 5S, all the practitioners, all the uh, coordinators of your program, such as 5S or QNS, can all uh, form an, a community of practice across the different units of the organization, and they can actually uh, share, share what they're doing, share practices that they that already work, and even help 
each other in solving problems. So I remember in, way back in the when I was with the AP, we had done something like a community practice of some sort for project managers. And one of the topics, it was so, so uh, interesting that the, that the COP uh, uh, touched was, how do you deal with difficult participants, especially with project managers in charge of training? So it was really uh, so valuable, all the insights provided by those who had experiences frontline and how, how they were able to, to, uh, to address it. And, and it, it, it helped uh, very much because some have not encountered such, such a situation before and so they would know how, would, how they would react in case it happens to them. And some also find some techniques would be better than others. So it was a good sharing um, among project managers in some, uh, when, when, they, when they met uh, in a community of practice discussing about training. So Wenger, actually, there is a, a definition of community of practice. Wenger um, defines it as groups of people who share a concern, a set of problems, or a passion about the topic. So it doesn't really have to be you're all in the same functional units. Maybe you belong to different units, no? cross-functional, but you share a problem. It cuts across, so you can also be you can also organize your own community of practice. Uh, there are other ways of also of sharing uh, best practice sharing. COP is only one. There there are also what we call uh, peer assist. Uh, you you have a subject matter expert either coming from inside the organization or outside, or you you also have storytelling. Storytelling is actually more animated because you are and, and, and uh, you are actually engaged in hearing how the story unfolds. And this has been a very successful way of, of, of sharing practices because it's in the form of a story and so many other uh, ways. Community of practice is only one, but the most used, I, I, I would say. So what are the characteristics of uh, communities of practice? So okay, we, they are, are formed to share and create common skills. So they have the members have common skills, common knowledge and expertise. And actually, uh, as I mentioned, it, you can form COPs within your agency, uh, same unit or across different functions or beyond the organization. You can have members from outside your organization, outside your agency. And the size of the um, membership varies. No? According to Wenger, it can vary from two to three, two thousands of people. I could just imagine if thousands of people might be too, too unwieldy. In, in, in the cases, cases I will mention or examples that I will mention later, I think the most that we had a COPs uh, membership was 10. I, I will explain that later. And there are three uh, important or essential elements of a COP, the domain, uh, which means that the COP uh, has an identity defined by a shared domain of interest, a shared competence. That's why we say they, they share something. There's something in common. And they have competence, they have experience, expertise on that matter, so they can share that, contribute to the sharing. And the community refers to the platform. As I mentioned also a while back, uh, used to be we, we were doing this face-to-face, -face, but now uh, it, is, it is quite difficult. So there will be more virtual um, COPs, sharing of best practices virtually as we're now doing during this GPPR forum. And uh, a case in point is uh, the DOH when they had the uh, doing their key and they mentioned about um, their community of practice of IT professionals uh, because there are IT professionals across the different regional offices across the uh, nationwide. So they called it HITPRO, H-I-T-P-R-O, Health IT Professionals. So instead of meeting, it was even before the pandemic, 
instead of having to fly over, which will entail a lot of cost, to meet face to face, they share virtually with IT professionals from across from nationwide and the different DOH regional offices. And of course, uh, the, the third element is the practice. The members of this, we know that they they have experience. They are the practitioners, so they know what they're talking about. They have they have uh, they know what works and they know what does not work. And uh, at this point, uh, we had a great help using uh, in, in in launching the best practice network in the Philippines because of uh, our. Um, APO, the Asian Productivity Organization, when they uh, organize the best practice network for all APO member countries. So they, they encourage the NPOs in the Philippines, it is the Development Academy of the Philippines, they encourage the NPOs to also form local, a local benchmarking network. In the Philippines, it's called uh, BPEX, or the Best Practice Exchange Network, the BPEX. And at the local, uh, the local networks now uh, form partnerships with industry associations which, or sector associations, which they call the peak body, to, to form also sectoral uh, benchmarking groups or sectoral community of practice, COPs. Okay, and the objectives of the APO Best Practice Network was to generate knowledge on best practices for all the national productive organizations. So, uh, so it was to, to encourage each of the NPOs to generate these best practices so that they can be shared in helping their uh, client organizations. And this also Another objective is to support the transfer of best practice knowledge so that uh, there is a, a way of being able to, to replicate this uh, to the customers or the clients of the NPOs. And, and, and it was because of this that they wanted uh, the NPOs, uh, they were being groomed to be leaders in this knowledge transfer. So it took a different perspective because in the previously, uh, Many of the APO programs were more of assistance, but they were taking a different stance uh, with respect to the best practice network. It was more of a sharing and learning perspective that they wanted rather than the assistance perspective. And uh, these are some of the uh, communities of practice that were formed. Uh, we had uh, four um, sectors. Uh, one was from the in-house call center, one was from, was on healthcare, the other on SMEs, and the other is on government. So the most member members we had was on government. We had 10. And uh, it, it, the members actually uh, comprise of both public and, and uh, well, public and private, specifically for healthcare and for the government uh, sector. The rest are actually more private, private sector. So like one of our most active uh, COPs was from the SMEs. They were com composed of um, owners of uh, services from, uh, not just services, but also food manufacturing or food processing, food service. And we also have ceramic healthcare and even a mining service and automotive service. And the peak body, take note of the peak bodies. The peak bodies were also um, already um, exposed to quality and productivity. So for the in-house call center, the peak body was the Philippine Society for Quality. For healthcare, it was the PSQA, Philippine Society for Quality in Healthcare. For the SME, it was the Philippine PQM Foundation, which was organized by BPI. And the government, they formed an association uh, for local e-government champions. And uh, they aligned their, um, bench, uh, their, their COP's topic uh, to the APO's themes. So there were three themes that were 
considered, first was to have to do local benchmarking, second was the organizational excellence, and KPIs, and the third is the public service excellence. So in that, uh, as you will see, the COPs actually uh, talked about, um, like in the case of healthcare, control of medication errors. And for the SMEs, uh, they, they, uh, they uh, shared and learned about uh, KPIs in handling customer feedback. Maybe we can look closely at the SMEs. The SME Benchmarking Group, uh, they went into uh, brainstorming at what topic they were going to uh, uh, do uh, sharing and learning for the COP. And these were among the suggestions they came up with to, to, uh, to address the theme of the APO on KPIs in SMEs. And you will see one of them was about handling customer feedback, especially negative feedback. And it was uh, very interesting. When we asked them, okay, there were five who participated, five SMEs. Then we asked them, can you map out your process for handling customer complaints? So they did, and we tried to look into similarities and differences. What was similar and what were similar and what were unique, some of the um, SMEs. So we laid them down so that we could see them clearly. And then from there, we uh, took the common ones, the, the ones that they all go through. So it was summarized in this manner. So you have uh, receiving customer feedback, registering this feedback, and uh, routing it. And the evaluation actually took two, two, um, two ways. There was a quick fix because you needed to work on it right away, work on the complaint right away, address that complaint. So it was immediate corrective action that was required. While the one that um, may take a little longer to do, they needed systematic problem solving. So at the end, they looked into how customers were satisfied uh, for the for the action taken, and that's the end of the process. So we, uh, the, uh, looking at the different uh, process steps, it was actually summarized in this manner. So they see it follows this this uh, simple process. So they looked at whose responsibility and a description of how this feedback. Um, the tracking of this feedback. And also we asked them to come up with their uh, five key performance indicators for each of those steps in their process. And uh, some of them uh, were on number of complaints. For both immediate, for both quick fixes and system fix, they look into resolution rate, how much uh, complaints how many complaints were resolved uh, over total number? And then the resolution rate, how fast uh, was the resolution resolved? And also costs, and of course, customer satisfaction level. So insights uh, from the uh, participating SMEs regarding this co handling customer feedback study were as follows, they, they found uh, it's, it was good to use devices like a notebook for recording complaints. Also, some of them uh, made use of activity boards um, in monitoring customer feedback so that it's easy to see uh, visually, there's communication is better. Um, and then also they made, uh, they also uh, believe that it would be good to also use rewards and recognition to encourage collection and reporting of complaints. And one other thing is that they now uh, acknowledge that integrating this process uh, as a source of improvement ideas in their Kaizen or quality circle activities, because these SMEs were really into T TQM, because they're, they're part of the TQM foundation of the DTI, and they were into also quality circle activities. So they found it very helpful to integrate this process in their uh, quality circle activities. And lastly, uh, the key emitters of COPs may start as something simple, 
within the organization. In the cases, in the case that I presented, it was actually um, membership was coming from different uh, different organizations outside of the outside of the, the one just one organization. So they, these are the enablers. Why 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 uh, these COPs uh, actually uh, thrived during that time? It was because it it would be, it was helpful that. APOBP and set the 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 guide to towards uh, how this can be done in, in a way setting the standard as to how this can be done by the different APOs and then also there was already a systematic benchmarking process that APO introduced so that everybody was using the same uh, process and also uh, organizations it was it was a delight with these uh, uh, clients uh, were very much interested in, in, in uh, doing this and supporting the benchmarking effort. Also, we, we found also that uh, the industry associations, uh, what we call the peak bodies, were very much cooperative. They really wanted to be able to uh, participate in, in, in the forming of this um, sectoral uh, COPs or benchmarking groups and then also promoting the program through the conduct of executive briefings and seminars so that everybody's on the same page that this is all about and always aligning it to the Philippine Quality Award Performance Excellence Framework. Also designating a point person and a team to handle the benchmarking program. And last, second to last, the most important, the support that they get from having a budget allocated for, the, for this kind of um, uh, projects and actually while they they were doing it, uh, it would, it was also fun for them because we did a rotation of uh, uh, every we were doing this face to face, so they were actually uh, round robin in hosting. We did a round robin of hosting, so we get to see the SME, uh, their their uh, production process, uh, the what they do. So there was more of uh, a lot of sharing and learning um, from each um, SME and also they, they had a touch of you know they became so so close that they were able to to make it possible um, the sharing and learning part was really made possible because of that okay that ends the uh, presentation on the community of practice and uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to be able to share uh, something about uh, the use of communities of practice in best practice sharing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Lan Lan. According to Director Augustine, this GBPR forum that we are conducting today is actually a form of communities of practice. And the plan is to develop GBPR to eventually evolve into a community of practice. So if you have any questions for Ms. Lan Lan, please type them in the chat box and we will answer them later after the first best practice presenter. Please be uh, aware that we will only be selecting two to three questions for the Q&A round and any unanswered questions in this round will be raised later on in the open forum at around 4.30 in the afternoon. We would also like to inform the audience that aside from Zoom, we are also live on YouTube and our video will remain available there um, until it's still available there. So if at any time you wish to review the presentations, feel free to check out our YouTube channel. It's DAP Training Courses Online. Again, that's DAP Training Courses Online. All right, so we move on to our first best practice presenter. The city government of Muntinlupa was recognized in 2015 for their best practice uh, titled Single Window Transaction Modified Business One Stop Shop, or this is Sweet Emboss. To deliver the presentation, ladies and gentlemen, 
please welcome the head of the examiner's division of the business purpose and licensing office miss abigail garcia take it away miss abigail all right thank you kate good afternoon everyone so let me share my screen So are we good? Can you see my screen now? All right. So good afternoon, everyone. Again, I am Abigail Garcia from the BPLO of Muntinlupa City or the Business Permit and Licensing Office of Muntinlupa City. And I am here to present on behalf of our local chief executive, Mayor Jaime R. Fresnetti. We appreciate this opportunity to share once again one of our city's best practices, the single window transaction or suite, an initiative of our business permit and licensing office, which was initially designed for the processing of business permit applications and renewal. Through the suite, a transaction is completed in just one interface between a client and the same service provider or frontliner in as short as 15 minutes. The SWEET initiative is a product of our local government's approach to service delivery, the client and the client's needs or requirements at the center as the focus of how we provide services. Kumbaga po, yung spotlight na kasentro sa taxpayer or client so that we, a service provider, are really conscious of customer experience, satisfaction level, and feedback. Additionally, the suite is in line with Montinlupa City's vision as a leading investment hub in the country. Toward the end, the city government was determined to transform our services by simplifying procedures through streamlining and making processes seamless and more efficient, as well as training and upskilling of our staff to be more professional, competent, and proficient. The business one-stop shop or boss was pioneered in Muntinlupa in the 1990s. Beginning with 12 steps, the permit process was reduced to six steps. This innovative simplified system in the area of ease of doing business garnered for the LGU the most business friendly award from the Philippine Chamber of Commerce and Industry in 2001 and 2002, and a special citation in 2006. Fast forward to 2013, the modified boss or emboss was implemented, further streamlining the process to three steps. Its year-round implementation was institutionalized in 2014. The following year, the innovative single window transaction was introduced and institutionalized. Now, what is unique about Suite is a single interface between client and frontliner throughout the process. The need to move from one transaction window to another has been eliminated. So wala na rin yung tendency for repetitive Q&A, making the process a seamless experience for the client. The same frontliner encodes pertinent information into the system and prints the assessment, accepts the payment, endorses the payment to the detailed cashier, and releases the business permit certificate within the standard time of 30 minutes as indicated in our citizen's charter, but we can deliver in as short as 15 minutes. This is the process in detail. Makikita po ninyo na yung proseso ay streamlined, so it's simple and short. When the client's number is called and flashed on the monitor, the client proceeds to the appropriate window and gives the application documents to the BPLO staff. The documents are routed through the back room of the boss area for assessment of the building office, the zoning office, and other regulatory departments as may be necessary. Then all relevant information are encoded by the frontliner into the system. The same personnel prints the building statement endorses it to the Bureau of the Fire Protection for the fire inspection piece and presents the assessment to the client. The same staff receives the payment, which is endorsed 
again, once again, in the backroom area. Gets the receipt and community tax certificate, which the staff hands over to the client together with the signed business permit. By the way, a business permit po sa Munting Lupa ay kailangan lamang ng pirma ng BPLO chief because whatever the amount paid by the taxpayer, the BPLO chief has the full authority of the mayor to approve and sign. Again, it's faster, less complicated, and that is ease of doing business for you. Now, before I proceed with my presentation, allow me to share with you a short video about SWEET. This video was shot before COVID-19 pandemic.
Is this Abigail? Yes. Yes. Sorry, sorry to interrupt your presentation, but I think the participants are having difficulty viewing the video. Um, I think it's because of the resolution. It's uh, too HD. That's why the audio is coming off as breaking up. So uh, I think the best thing to do here would be uh, to share the link to the video, uh, maybe later with the participants so that they can also watch it on their end. Perhaps we can start with the presentation in the interest of time. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you, Miss Abigail. All right. Okay. So, uh, sayang pala because hindi nyo na, na panood yung video, but uh, I will be sharing the link or I will give the link kasi nakapost ito sa Ami BPLO Facebook page. So, this video as well as yung isang video pa for later, just in case na maulat na hindi nyo ma-view, I will share it and uh, provide the link in the chat box. So, uh, ayun po, um, yun po ang nangyayari sa... Opisina namin, the processing of a business permit is uh, very easy dahil talaga po ang nakakausap lang ni taxpayer ay isang frontliner po at si frontliner po ang uh, siyang gumagawa ng lahat na supposedly nagagawin ni taxpayer sa pagbabayad at uh, sa pag-iikot uh, po. Okay, so now uh, let me proceed. Ito po yung uh, I'm going to discuss some of the struggles of uh, the personnel dito sa BPLO before we, before implementing uh, the single window transaction. Dati, examiners would only scrutinize the application documents and interview the client, while the billing division staff would do the encoding and printing of the order of payment, and so on and so forth. Kahit sa part ng taxpayers, merong resistance because honestly, the system at that time was working. So, kumpaga, why fix something that's not broken? So, we had discussions for the management commitment on continuable improvement and service excellence was communicated. The staff eventually understood, accepted, and underwent the necessary trainings. The mission of the office was clear and the management remained firm on implementing the single window transaction because it would enhance the whole process significantly. For hardware, we use laser jet and dot matrix printers para kompleto yung gagamitin ng bawat staff sa walong windows or sa walong workstations. Yung system naman is the same, so we didn't spend any for that. Dito pa pasok yung sinasabi kanina ni ASIC Magsina na to do more using the same resources. Also, please note that for the renewal of business permit, there is no need for the taxpayer to fill out an application form. Kami na po ang gagawa nito. We just print the information from the system. During the first few weeks of implementation, as expected, may mga times sa mas tumagal yung proseso because personnel were still learning to do all the steps properly. Staff previously focused on examination of documents, struggled with encoding figures and other information into designated computers. While those earlier assigned to issue the billing statement encountered the most difficulty in determining the sufficiency and veracity of documentary department submitted. But after the first month, the BPLO frontliners got used to the system and achieved target efficiency. Meanwhile, the suite has time and again been recognized as a best practice by local and international level organizations. And yes, kaya po nandito ang Montilu Pati Process of Forum na ito is because of what transpired five years ago. It was a great experience and we are very proud because suite was the only best practice from the public sector that elevated to the final round of the international best practice competition. And because of our innovative services, we bagged back-to-back -back the most business-friendly LGU Award in 2017 and 2018. It also continues to be benchmarked by various LGUs since we have shared domain of interest as mentioned earlier by Mom Elena Cruz when she tackled the community of practice. We are benchmarked by NGAs, academic institutions, and other organizations. Alam niyo po, if I may add, 
even way before the enactment of the EODB law noong 2018, and which provides for concierge type or one window transactions. Ang munting lupa po ay ginagawa na ang mga provisions ng batas na ito sa pamamagitan ng aming single window transaction. But none could be sweeter than the affirmation of clients whose feedback and testimonials provide validation to the quality of our service delivery, the client experience, and level of satisfaction that our processes and service providers are able to give. Of course, we haven't stopped efforts in looking for ways to make our services better. We maintain our commitment to continual improvement. Over the years, the suite has been expanded to cater to more transactions, not just business permit application and uh, for new and renewal of business permit. Further to complement the suite, we've also recently launched the business e-payment system, or what we call BEST, which also suits the need for this time of the pandemic. Business taxes can be paid online, business permit applications and renewal can be accommodated through this latest initiative. Ito pong single window transaction ay hindi naman rocket science. What is really innovative about it is the paradigm shift na nangyari as a result of the system implementation, which is very evident sa aming mga tauhan. Pagpasok niyo pa lang sa pintuan, you will see the big difference. The staff are very conscious about being professional and courteous toward clients at all times. Palaging nandun yung desire to make each transaction as fast, efficient, and convenient as possible. Nangyari po itong transformation na ito sa pagpapatupad ng suite. It's nothing short of remarkable dahil this was even beyond our expectations. Now, before I end my uh, presentation, I would like to share another video. But let's just try, okay? If uh, ma-review niyo po siya. If not, feel free to tell me, Ms. Kate. All right. No problem. All right. All right. So this is the scenario of, I would like to share with you, ito po yung itsura ng BPLO namin ngayon. The new normal setup ng aming BPLO. Miss Abigail? Yes. Yes, ma'am. The, the audio is still ch choppy. Maybe uh, we can share na lang the links later to our audience. Okay, I will. Sayang, sayang, sayang. Kasi nandun yung mga punchline ko sa Anyway, anyway, anyway. <laughs> so, I will be very happy to share the links for the videos. So, let me um, add my presentation na lang with this. That the boss, the business one-stop shop is sweet and the best in Munting Lupa. Maraming salamat po. Thank you. Thank you very much. So that was the city government of Munting Lupa with their sweet emboss. Thank you very much, Miss Abigail. Uh, well, uh, since we are in, in this uh, setup, the virtual setup, it is unavoidable that we sometimes experience technical difficulties but we try our best to uh, deliver by uh, you know sharing links and uh, uh, sharing uh, other presentation materials after the uh, live uh, cast so as i mentioned earlier the gbpr is now five years old and uh, the city government of Muntin lupa is part of the first batch of recognized best practices in the history of GBPR. So we shall now entertain questions from the audience based on presentations delivered by uh, Ms. Lanlan and uh, Ms. Abigail. So please type in your questions. If you have any questions for Ms. Lanlan, uh, her topic earlier was um, the best practice sharing and knowledge management approach. 
And for the presentation of uh, SIGOM, we have the WIT emboss. All right, I think we already have a question for, um, this is from Mel Greg Conception. So how did SWEET perform during the COVID-19 lockdown and address backlogs of releasing approvals of business permits and applications for new businesses? So I think ito po yung gusto nyong ipakita na video, ma'am. So um, maybe you can an uh, answer this question from Sir Conception. Okay, uh, good morning. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Um, how sweet works during the COVID-19 lockdown? So during the quarantine by ito, I'm afraid wala po kaming transaction on because the government, the LGU, is focused on giving relief goods and uh, wala po kaming opisina. But as per the backlogs, I am proud to say na wala pong backlogs ang BPL o muting lupa. Napakabilis lang po mag-process ng business permit sa amin. So, if you are, if you go here and under normal circumstances, you have complete requirements, may issue po agad ang inyong business permit. So, there is no backlog. Yun po. Wow, that's really yeah. great to know. Maybe I can set up a business now in Muntinlupa City. Yes, please. <laughs> You're welcome. All right, do we have any more questions from the audience? Feel free to type in questions from uh, for uh, Ms. Lanlan and Ms. Abigail. So we have another question here from Mr. Maximo Vicente. Is SWIT applicable to other government offices like BIR? Well, I can't say, I can't answer for BIR, but BIR is welcome to go here and benchmark in Muntinupa City. Sana po, sana, we hope, na magkaroon sila in the future ng single vendor transaction. Yes, yes. And that's actually the purpose of why we are conducting uh, yes. this uh, GBPR forum to share our best practices and perhaps other government agencies can benchmark from each other, no? Yes. All right, so... Uh, what, well, if there are any uh, no more questions for this round, don't worry. If, if you still have follow-up questions, we can still entertain them later at the open forum, later uh, at around 4.30. So thank you again, Miss Abigail. So thank you. And I apologize, for that. I apologize for, the, for the video logs. I will upload the links immediately for the benefit yes, of yes. the Okay. Yes, thank you very much. All, All right. right, so our, our second best practice presenter is the city of Paranaque, Kapit Bahay Lang. <laughs> so for them, they have a Project Express Lane Operation or Project ELO, which was one of the recognized best practices for this year's GBPR. So the presentation will be delivered by Attorney Melanie Soriano Malaya. She is the Chief of the Paranaque City's Business Permit and Licensing Office. She is also the President of the National Association of Business Permit and Licensing Offices, or NABLO. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Attorney Malaya. Hello. Yes, hello. Uh, yes, there, there. I have, I have now. Yeah. Hi, good afternoon. Yes. So we're ready. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. To a president and CEO, Attorney Engelbert C. Caronan Jr. of the Development Academy of the Philippines and executive committee members of the Government Best Practices Recognition uh, I also saw earlier Mr. Arnel Abanto, to ASEC uh, Toto Magsino of DBM, to Dr. Robin Mann of the Center of Organizational Excellence Research of Massey University of New Zealand, to Ms. Elena Abedillo Cruz, Knowledge Management and Benchmarking Expert, 
to fellow GPBR presenters awardees, yung kapitbahay namin, si Ms. Abby Garcia of Montinlupa, UP Diliman, DOST Region 9, colleagues in the public service, partners, ladies and gentlemen, isang magandang araw po sa inyong lahat. On behalf of Paranaque City Mayor Edwin L. Olivares, I would like to express my gratitude to the DAP for recognizing the city's project express lane operation as one of the government sector's best practices held last October 23 to 24, 2020. It is our honor and privilege to be included in this recognition award as this enabled us to demonstrate our initiative as we continue to improve the business environment, especially in addressing the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. Today's forum is timely and significant as we highlight the importance of knowledge sharing between and among national and local government to further strengthen partnerships and identify strategies that will improve the quality and delivery of public services. As highlighted during the presentation, the Project ELO was developed as a result of the city government's strong political commitment to simplify and integrate core processes and implement complementary reforms stated under RA 11032 or the Ease of Doing Business Act. The mandate of the city government of Paranaque emanates from the social and economic responsibility to provide an efficient and effective delivery of public services to ensure that the stakeholders like business organizations, the private sectors, the barangays and other community sectors are part of the transition or implementation plan. By first identifying pain points, issues and concerns Second, mapping out processes and requirements. Third, providing recommendations and strategies that will be implemented within the scope of the city government. We also emphasize the city's approach in using an agile and innovative solution in enhancing the functionalities of the system. By this way, we were able to achieve the following key milestones. First, the reduction of procedures and time from 19 steps, seven days in 2013, to three steps, three days for a new business and one day for renewal. Increase in business tax collection, business taxes and fees collection from 1 billion in 2013 to 3.57 billion in 2020, or an increase of 300% in our collection. Also, an increase in business registration from 17,000 to almost 27,000. We have also institutionalized BPLO under ordinance number 17-43 in December 2017. And uh, institu institutionalization of the project express lane operation under executive order number 18-14 in May 2018. We have also uh, added features such as online appointment system, online business application for new and renewal, online assessment and payment, use of courier and delivery service, and the use of electronic signature. We have also been used as benchmarking for benchmarking activities for local government units on streamlining of business permitting processes. By the way, tama si Ms. Abby. Nag-benchmark din po kami sa Muntinlupa for their uh, SWIFT SWIFT project. Aside from addressing the regulatory side of the business-related transactions, part of the strategy is also to equip and train each personnel with appropriate knowledge and skills to understand the whole business registration process, especially now that we are about to deliver our new digital normal strategies by next month in January, which is the renewal period for uh, uh, mayor's permit. We also intend to provide an evidence-based result that will focus on customer satisfaction feedback to the city government services. With that, I would like again to thank DAP for this opportunity as well as to the GBPR presenters for sharing your insights and expertise. I urge everyone to actively participate in the chat box or in the open forum. 
Now let's watch uh, the entry of the Paranaque City for DAP's recognized best practices for 2020. Muli maraming salamat po at mabuhay po tayong lahat. As part of the administration's socioeconomic agenda on improving competitiveness in the ease of doing business, the local government of Paranaque has institutionalized the Business Permits and Licensing Office as the primary unit responsible for creating a business-friendly environment for local and foreign investors in the city of Paranaque. Before the passage of RA 11032 or the EODB law, the local government has been advocating for development of an innovative and agile business solution to further improve the business permitting process. This leads to the issuance of Executive Order No. 18-14, Series of 2018, to institutionalize the creation and implementation of the Project Express Lane Operation, ELO for ELO. The project primarily aims to simplify and integrate business permitting process to enhance business and consumer confidence and improve the delivery of public service. Project ELO employs a whole of local government approach composed of various departments and offices involved in business permitting, such as the Business Permits and Licensing Office, the City Planning and Development Coordinator's Office, the Office of the City Building Official, the City Health Office, the City Treasurer's Office, Liga ng Mga Barangay, the Bureau of Fire Protection, the City Environment and Natural Resources Office, and the Philippine National Police. Project ELO boasts of the following salient features. The use of concierge-type arrangement for accepting and releasing business-related documents, use of unified application form and single checklist of documentary requirements, co-location of all departments and offices, including the BFP and the city treasury, one-time assessment and payment of local taxes, fees, and charges, simultaneous release of all clearances and permits, and the Barangay Clearance Online Integration System. Evolving from the traditional business one-stop shop, Project ELO has made business registration in the city of Paranaque more efficient and effective using innovative business solutions and productivity measures which trim down the business registration process into three simple steps. Step 1. Application, Verification, and Assessment Step 2. One-time Payment and Step 3. Simultaneous Release of All Permits and Clearances Filling up multiple forms is a thing of the past as a unified form is utilized to gather necessary information to be used by other departments and offices. Co-location eases the physical and mental burden that applicants go through in registering their business as customers need not go from one office to another to secure their permits or clearances. One of the milestones of Project ELO is the online integration of Barangay Clearance, which can now be applied, paid, and issued at the Project ELO Concierge. All of the barangays can monitor in real time all applications and payment transactions using an integrated software developed by the IT team of the Project ELO. And the one-time assessment and payment of local taxes, fees, and charges paved the way for the simultaneous release of all permits and clearances. A vision of the Ease of Doing Business Act brought to life by Project ELO. The Game Changer The Game Changer in the reform in the business registration process. It adopts an application tracking system which enables the customers to view the milestones and progress of their application while waiting at the concierge lobby. The document management system ensures that all business related documents digitized and stored in a central data bank immediately monitored and verified. The city of Paranaque adheres to the data protection and privacy of collected information in the documents. The use of smart kiosk reinvents the experience acting at the city hall. The kiosk will enable the applicants to generate their application forms and win 
Olivares assumed office in 2013, his brand of public service was anchored on Bagong Paranaque, business-friendly environment, academic excellence, good governance in public order, opportunities for livelihood and housing, nutrition, health, and senior citizens' welfare and social services, and God-centered leadership. True to his brand of public service, Mayor Olivares through Project ELO was able to simplify the business registration in the city of Paranaque from 19 steps to 3. This resulted to the increase in the number of registered businesses in the city at 27,000 in 2019. Along with it is an increase in business tax collection from 1 billion in 2.5 billion in 2020. This turned the city of Paranaque into a haven of benchmarking activities. Project ELO has been recognized by both national and local government in its effort to undertake drastic reform initiatives on business permitting process. The city of Paranaque intends to enhance the functionalities of the system to be more responsive in the needs of the stakeholders and provide options in other business-related services, especially in this time of pandemic. The next chapter the next in e-governance e services. To ensure sustainability and continuous improvement of the project ELO, the city of Paranaque developed the following iterations. Simplification of regulatory processes and requirements. The use of digital management tools and applications. Automation of business registration process an application of advanced digital tools and connectivity to the national government portal. Hello 3.0 In addressing contemporary needs, the city of Paranaque introduced the following innovations in e-governance services. For non-automated business-related transactions, the online appointment and scheduling system was designed to cater to clients on a first-come, first-served basis. Business permit application is only one click away with the City of Paranaque's online application system. Clients may now file, submit, and upload their documentary requirements in with financial service providers. Business applicants need not physically go to the City Hall to transact their business. An innovation in the online courier and delivery system provides for unique services that promote zero-contact transactions at the City Hall. ExpressLink Online was made possible through the partnership of the City of Paranaque with the League of Municipalities of the Philippines and Gracia Telecom Corporation. These intelligent payment machines aim to digitize local government transactions as well as provide payment options for businesses. They deliver government service directly to the clients. As part of its preventive measures and for the promotion of paperless transactions, the city of Paranaque has now employed electronic signatures. Hello, 3.1. Moving forward, the city aims to expand its e-governance services by connecting to the national government portal to realize an end-to-end -end online business registration. In line with this, the city intends to utilize the following electronic receipts, electronic permits and licenses, and to connect to the national government portal, like the Central Business Portal, the Philippine Business Data Bank, and the Business Name Registration System, Next Generation. In fact, the City of Paranaque is the first local government unit connected to the DTI Business Name Registration System, Next Generation. The system integration allows both parties to check the validity of business name registration. In addition, the City of Paranaque is closely working with TICT and ARTA for the Central Business Portal and the Philippine Business Data Bank. Towards this end, the City of Paranaque commits to the fulfillment of Project ELO in the delivery of public services and contribution to nation building. Project ELO Servicio de Okay, so that's it. We That's the presentation from the city government of Paranaque. Thank you very much, Attorney Malaya, 
for sharing your best practice, Project ELO. So uh, to our audience, please go ahead and type your questions if you have any. Uh, while waiting for the questions to come in, I would like to share with you a quick trivia. Did you know that the Paranaque BPLO also won four awards at the Digital Governance Awards, Best Practices in Information and communica Communications Technology, as conferred by the Department of Interior and Local Government in 2019. So, award winner po talaga itong si City Government of Paranaque. Now, uh, do we have any questions for Attorney Malaya? while she's with us. We have proud residents of Paranaque City among the audience. All right, so it seems that uh, we don't have any pending questions for now. If we do receive uh, any questions, I hope it will be okay that uh, we can email Attorney Malaya for re regarding these. Okay lang po ba, ma'am? <laughs> yes, okay. Yeah. All right, so uh, that's it. We will go ahead and move forward to our next presenter. Again, thank you very much to Attorney Malaya. Thank you, thank you Merry Christmas, Pa. Now, along with the city government of Paranaque, we also have another one of the recognized best practices for 2020. This is the University of the Philippines Diliman with their best practice development of the UP Diliman Supply and Property Management Office, Common Use Supplies and Equipment. So that is shortened to SPMO CSE Portal. So this will be presented by another lawyer, Attorney Rachel A. Loxin, officer in charge of the UP Diliman SPMO. Good afternoon, everyone. Ayon. I hope uh, naririnig nyo ako. Uh, anyway, I am Attorney Rachel Loxin. Um, joining with me this afternoon is our very own uh, Vice Chancellor for Administration, uh, Professor Adeline Pasha. Also present today is our section head, Mr. Bayani Cantada, and some of our staff are also present in today's forum, and others are watching via YouTube Live. I have the honor to present our entry in the 2020 Government Best Practice Recognition entitled Development of UP Diliman Supply and Property Management Office, Common Use Supplies and Equipment Portal, or UPD SPMO CSE Portal. Uh, can I share my screen? Okay. Share. So, okay, so let us all watch our presentation. Portal or UPD SPMO CSE Portal. As a University of the Philippines Diliman or UPD Service Unit, the UPD Supply and Property Management Office or UPD SPMO is in charge of the overall acquisition of common use supplies and equipment from the procurement service of the Department of Budget and Management or PSDPM. Utilization and Inventory of Property, Plant and Equipment or PPE and the disposition of unserviceable or no longer needed property and equipment of the university. We are dedicated to supporting the university's mandate by providing quality service in the field of supply and property management through modern innovation, efficient, and prompt action. We envision to lead in the field of supply and property management by providing modern and innovative service. Prior to the development of the UPD SPMO CSE portal, ordering common use supplies and equipment was done through manual processing. Having been chosen as one of the 20 government agencies to pilot test the PSDBM's virtual store, 
UPD through SPMO has devised ways on how to be in step with PSDBM's innovative procedures. UPD SPMOs developed a system that would meet the needs of the UPD units in ordering common new supplies and equipment from PSDBM. The UPD SPMO is the only authorized unit that could transact with the PSDBM virtual store on behalf of UPD. It is the sole representative of around 170 UPD units, which include administrative offices and colleges. As such, UPD units can no longer purchase at the PSDBM on their own. Only transactions made through UPD SPMO will be honored by the PSDBM virtual store in the purchase of common new supplies and equipment. Procuring supplies is now easy with the UPD SPMO CSE portal. As indicated in the UPD SPMO Citizens Charter, current processing time takes only four and a half hours compared to the previous time of four days. This is seven times faster than the previous manual process and saves the university close to 27.5 hours waiting time per transaction. Prior to the UPD SPMO CSE portal, end users would physically go to SPMO and request that the certificate of non-availability of stocks or sinus be issued. Now, end users would only need to go to the portal and click print to get the sinus. Total transactions eliminated due to this online process of sinus issuance is 15,518 requests or an average of 1,293 per month or 58 requests per day. The amount of time saved from manual processing of a sinus, which is about 5 minutes from printing to signing, is about 290 minutes per day or 58 requests per day times 5 minutes per request or around 5 hours in a day. The UPD SPMO CSE portal has the following functions. The registered end users can order the common use supplies and equipment or CSE wherever they may be, provided they have access to internet. How to use the UPD Demand Supply and Property Management Office, Common Use Supplies and Equipment Portal, or UPD SPMO CSE Portal. The first thing that the end user needs to do is to register. How to register in the portal? It's easy. First, open your browser and go to UPD SPMO website by typing spmo.upd.edu.ph. Then click CSE Portal from the website. Second, fill out the required fields. Click the register button and look for your specific unit or office. Put all the required details such as your name, unit, email, username, and password. Only UP email account is recognized by our system. Third, Wait for an activation link to be sent through email. After registration, the end users will be sent an activation link. They just need to click the activation link to log in the SPMO CSE portal. Now, we will go to online requisition of common use supplies and equipment. First, log in with your registered credentials. Type the registered username and password. Second, select the items to procure from the product catalog. Look for the items from the product catalog and specify the quantity. And click the Add to Cart button. If there is a need to add more items, just click Add More Items button. Before the end users can request from the UPD SPMO CSA portal, they need to submit to UPD SPMO their annual procurement plan for common use supplies and equipment or APPCSE. The maximum items to be requested by the end users is based on their submitted APPCSE. Third, confirm selected items for reservation and print the automatic generated requisition and issue slip or RIS. Have this approved and signed by the authorized signatory and budget cleared by the accounting or budget office. Items will be reserved for three days. 
if the requisition and issue slip is not processed within the reservation period, items will be reverted back to the central available stocks. Fourth, present approved requisition and issue slip to UPD SPMO Central Storeroom and claim the items. The SPMO CSE portal has the following additional features in its archive section. Certificate of non-availability of stocks or CNAS issued by the PSDBM. List of common use supplies and equipment issued by the PSDBM where it indicates the earliest availability of the out-of-stock items from the PSDBM. List of available stocks or LAS issued by UPD SPMO and Statement of Non-Availability of Stocks or SNES issued by UPD SPMO, which can be attached as documentary requirements in case end users opt to purchase the same from outside suppliers. This, however, is still subject to Republic Act No. 9184 and its implementing rules and regulations. The validity of the Certificate of Non-Availability of Stocks or CNES from the PSDBM and the Statement of Non-Availability of Stocks or SNES from the UPDS PMO is 15 days reckoned from the date of publication. We have updated our UPDS PMO CSE portal to allow the end users to order the balance from their previous month's Annual Procurement Plan for Common Use Supplies and Equipment or ATP CSE. In 2021, we will be implementing an e-wallet account for the end users so that their order will be confirmed immediately without going through the budget or accounting office for budget clearance. The amount of time that will be saved upon the implementation of the e-wallet feature would be two days. During the implementation of the UPD SPMO CSE portal, there's an increase of around 250% in the total amount purchased by the end users from October 2019 to September 2020 in the amount of 7 million nine hundred nineteen thousand six hundred fifty pesos and 14 centavos with 700 transactions, not including the period of enhanced community quarantine as compared to only 2,846,746 pesos and 94 centavos with 527 transactions from October 2018 to September at the Administrative Staff Program Towards Institutional Resiliency and Excellence or ASPIRE program, the UPD SPMO presented existing process flow and proposed some changes, including but not limited to the posting online of the Statement of Non-Availability of Stocks or SNES to its Facebook page. The ASPIRE committee recognized the proposal and during the graduation ceremony, the UPD SPMO was given a high impact award for its innovation. The ASPIRE committee also recognized UPD SPMO's proposal for the processing of requisition and issue slip or RIS for common use supplies and equipment as most promising proposal. The UPD SPMO Common Use Supplies and Equipment Portal was included in the 26 finalists and eventually was awarded last 23rd of October 2020 as one of the 10 winners in the 2020 Government Best Practices Recognition or GBPR. These are the 10 uh, best practices that we saw that was worth emulating at this stage. No? We know that a lot of you have done uh, a lot of work, but we found some of them that lack more evidences, maybe in the write-up, or are still the early stages of implementation, and we think that uh, we will be able to further improve on it. But for this 10, uh, we would just like to highlight that these are the best practices that you could be proud of, and you could continue work on, working, working on. So the journey towards quality and improvement and best practice never stops. So, and the COVID, uh, the COVID pandemic has brought a lot of challenges for you and a lot of opportunities too. So many of your programs came out because of the COVID and they were improved, like all the automation and uh, uh, better access and productivity. So without much ado, with, uh, we, will, we would like to announce it, that 10 winners, not in, in any particular order, but they're all worthy of the best practice recognition for 2020. So let's go one by one. 
Uh, you piece the lima supply. So let's give them a, <laughs> a round of applause. Okay, for your for your property management system. Warm congratulatory greetings were received from the following. HRDO UP Diliman UP NEC UP Diliman Office of the Vice Chancellor for Community Affairs UP Diliman Information Office Official page and website of UP Diliman Chancellor Fidel Nemenzo and many other beloved officers from the university UP Diliman Chancellor Dr. Fidel Arnimenzo in his congratulatory message emphasized that this should inspire other units to think of ways of improving their services and operations. The idea of best practice is important because it is about setting models of practice which redound to improvement of services in other units and universities. He even instructed the UPD Information Office to disseminate the news to all constituents of UPD. In a survey conducted by UPD SPMO for the use of its CSE portal, 92 responded. Of these, 96.7% responded that the CSE portal helped in making the process of ordering common use supplies and equipment fast and easy. Meanwhile, 94.6% responded that the CSE portal was able to successfully solve the problem on reservation of CSE at UPDS PMO. The rest of the respondents made suggestions on how to further improve the UPDS PMO CSE portal. The initiatives of UPDS PMO to further improve their service earned them a request from the Pamantasan ng Lungsod ng Muntinlupa asking that they be the agency where the state university could conduct a benchmarking activity. The UPD SPMO continues to improve its system to cope with the changing times as we move to deliver excellent service to all concerned. We are the UP Diliman Supply and Property Management Office. So that's all for our presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Attorney Loxine, for sharing your best practice, the SPMO CSE portal. And we are likewise the presence of UP Diliman Vice Chancellor for Administration, Professor Adeline Pasha. And of course, the staff of the UPD as a very well thought of video presentation. For any questions regarding Attorney Loxin's presentation, please send them over via the chat box. We'll answer them later. For now, we will have a short intermission before we resume with the short Q&A and the presentation of our best practice presenter and our last speaker. So go ahead and take your breaks, everyone. See you later.
we're back. Welcome back, everyone. All right, so in the interest of time, we shall proceed with uh, our last best practice presenter. Don't worry, all of your questions will be answered later at the open forum. So we ask, we also ask our presenters to remain in the room with us. Up next, we have the Department of Science and Technology Region 9 with their entry in the GBPR 2017 recognized best practice laboratory online referral system and innovation in government service delivery. This will be presented by the Assistant Regional Director, Ms. Rosemary S. Salazar. ARD Salazar, are you here with us? Yes, good afternoon, everyone. All right. uh, let, let me just uh, turn off again my video so that I will have a good bandwidth and let me share my screen. Hindi yun sa kan. Then, nasabi man nyo. Ataki. Yeah. Good afternoon. I hope you can hear me well, no? Yes, uh, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Buenas tardes a todos. Uh, I'm Rosemary Salazar, and it is my pleasure to share with you our organization's best practice entitled Laboratory Samples Online Referral System and Innovation in Government Service Delivery. In 2017, uh, this best practice, best practice was uh, awarded, recognized and awarded by the Development Academy of the Philippines. And in 2018, I entered this in the sixth international best practice competition held that time in United Arab Emirates. So this press, I will use the presentation that I used last 2018. And I hope that this will also inspire our two presenters, the 2020 uh, winners of the best practice uh, government best practice recognition, not to also uh, join the com international competition uh, if there is maybe next year. No? So let me start. Uh, okay. Our organization is one of the 16 regional offices of the Department of Science and Technology spread across the country. We are located at the southern tip of the Philippines, which is about 865 kilometers from the capital, Manila. It will take you about an hour and a half flying time to reach my city. We are a small organization of 85 implementing five core services, course, one of which is the labor laboratory testing and calibration. It is a fact that not one laboratory can cater to the diverse testing and calibration needs of a customer, even the laboratories based in Metro Manila. Putting up a new laboratory entails quite an investment which the government cannot afford that, that easy. With limited service offerings, we often turn away customers and they have to fend for themselves and to look for laboratories that can cater to their needs. With a desire to improve our service and provide our customers with a one-touch facility, we put together a team of dedicated IT geeks to develop a platform that will allow laboratories to virtually communicate through a network of computers. Hence, the Laboratory Samples Online Referral System was born. The objective is to provide customers with convenient and easy access to testing and calibra calibration services at a single touch point. We organized the laboratories of DOSD to a network called OneLab, where the online referral system is deployed. 
The online referral system allows for seam seamless handling of samples from receiving, referral, transport, analysis, to prompt delivery of laboratory reports, no matter where you are in the country. The customer now need only to visit a laboratory of the network and his requirements will be met. In 2015, we deployed the ID system to our DOST laboratories across the country, 16 laboratories of the regional offices and six laboratories of the research and development institutes. In 2018, we have deployed, deployed the referral system to 22 laboratories from other government and private organizations who joined the OneLab network. More than that, we have expanded our reach to the ASEAN neighbors with three international members from Vietnam and Thailand. Since its deployment in 2015, we facilitated a total of 740 referrals involving 1,456 samples that required 3,292 tests and calibration works. A total of 3.4 million pesos of laboratory fees was also collected. We see an increasing trend in the key performance indicators that we track from the exchange of samples referred by laboratories among the network members. Because of the referral system, we had 740 customers whose requirements were met, 740 customers whose time were not wasted, 740 customers who need not shuttle from one laboratory to another. We have yet to quantify the financial savings for the government laboratories because we, need, we did not put up new service, purchase new equipment, rent new space, and hire additional staff. We humbled ourselves to look at best-in-class organizations to learn and improve our systems. In a hospital setting in my city, they refer sample specimen to laboratories in Manila. How they do it? They have partner hospitals and doctors, so they call and they send the samples. No IT systems to track the, the, status, to track the status of the samples. In my meetings with the officials of the Standard Control Laboratory of the Malaya Malaysian Rubber Board, they have an online system for seamless sample management to, re to the release of test reports, but this is only confined among, their lab among the laboratories in their organization. Big laboratories like SGS and Intertech have superb sample management systems backed with robust IT platform. Again, they are confined to work within their organization worldwide. We claim that this is a best practice because the referral system brought together competing laboratories to virtually communicate with each other, to work as one, to share resources and expertise. As an affirmation, the referral system was recognized by the Development Academy of the Philippines in 2017. We do not rest on our laurels. We keep challenging our, ourselves to provide better service. We target to deploy our system to all the 81 DOSD Provincial Science and Technology Centers to serve as sample receiving stations to expand our reach to the remotest of the community. We endeavor to continue to promote and recruit laboratories in the country and the ASEAN to widen our reach and service offerings. Just a month ago, we did a roadshow in Brunei and Malaysia to promote the network. And we recently received the signed memorandum of understanding from one of the labs we visited. Institu institutionalizing change is not a walk in the park. 
many challenges are met and many lessons are learned. Let me share with you some of these lessons. The best practice is successful when you choose the right partners who share the same values. The best practice works when you have engaged workforce and team members. The system works better when it is web hosted. And the best practice is better managed when it is monitored real time. To end, allow me to introduce the rock stars behind this Indeed Voice. First off, we have our uh, Undersecretary for Regional Operations as our brain, no? Yusek Brenda Nazareth Mansano. Next is my Regional Director, who avidly supports this project, Mr. Martin Ree. And then let me introduce to you the three IT programmers, uh, Mr. Aris Moratalia, Mr. Ronel, Ronel Gundoy, and Sunny Boy Gekosala. Next, we have Ms. Bernadette Belamide, our customer relations officer, who is the one in charge of receiving and referring the sample. And last but not the least, was truly the second brain. Thank you. The competition allows you only to present in eight minutes, so I have to do that in that time. Thank you very much. Thank you, ARD Salazar. That was DOST 9's best practice, which was also presented during the sixth international best practice competition. So please go ahead and send in your questions if you have questions for ARD Salazar. And while waiting for the questions to come in, let us listen to our last um, expert. So we have Dr. Robin Mann. He will discuss uh, benchmarking best practices. Dr. Mann, are you ready? While waiting for Dr. Robin Mann, let me just inform everyone again that the competition for the GBPR best practices for COVID response is still open. You can submit your entries until December 20. So, um, Dr. Mann, are you are you live? Are you here with us? Yes, yeah, sorry, I am. I was just out. I was just out of the room. Okay. All right, that's good. We see you now, and we can hear you also. I think that last presentation ended very quickly. Yes, it was an eight minute presentation based on, I think she based it on uh, the time limit given to her during the international presentation. Yes, yes. But in any case, you're here with us now. So go ahead and take the floor. Okay, uh, I'll just find my presentation. And Yes, yeah, so, well, firstly, thank you very much for the Development Academy of the Philippines inviting me to present. Uh, so obviously, uh, I'm in New Zealand, and uh, what time is it here? It's coming up to uh, nine o'clock at night here. So uh, particular thanks for Tess Augustine for uh, inviting me, but also the, the rest of the team, um, Magdalena Mendoza, Arnold Abanto, Lani, you know, so I've known many of the people at that for many, many, many years. Um, also, some of the presenters today, I've also known or their organizations because previously they participated in the international best practice competition. So 
it's pleasing to see them present again and some new pre presenters too. Um, so I'll talk about benchmarking and uh, best best pra practice. Um, just so you know, uh, yes, I am from New Zealand and uh, I run what's called a Centre for Organisational Excellence Research. And that really consists of three organisations, uh, a research organisation at Massey University, a website resource sharing benchmarks and best practices, and uh, also got, we've got a consultancy providing training on business excellence and, and benchmarking. Um, what I want to talk about really is some of the work that we have been doing um, over the last year. Um, so first of all, talk about one of the research projects that we're doing, and it's the second one that's shown on this particular slide. It's called an exploration of the organizational excellence architecture required to support an award-winning business excellence journey. Uh, so as we heard uh, from the presentation um, a, few, a couple of hours ago now, um, yes, yes, the Philippines follows what's called the Bordage Criteria for Performance Excellence. And this can assist any organization to, to improve. So I recommend every organization, if you're not already using it, to, to, use, to use it to guide your improvement uh, journey. And as explained previously, it's a very simple framework, really. It just looks at your management systems and processes, how well you're performing them, and looks also at the results you achieve. And the whole purpose of this is just to identify your strengths and opportunities for improvement, and then put in place uh, action plans. Um, what I, I guess some people don't understand or have not recognized is that as well as calling them business excellence frameworks, they could equally be called productivity frameworks because they are made up of really inputs and outputs and that is what productivity is. So the input is really the business enablers and then the output is the results you achieve for your citizens uh, for the wider you know, community in terms of perhaps environmental impact and also making sure you use your budgets uh, responsibly as, as a government. Um, so, so this is what, 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 what this framework assesses, a very holistic framework and it's the only type of way we can assess really whether an organisation is on the way to world-class performance. And so um, when an organisation goes through an assessment, they're given a score, and it shows really where they are, then each year they can try to improve based on uh, their, their assessment results. And indeed, they should be improving as long as they um, have put in place previously relevant action plans and implemented those actions. Uh, but one thing that's not clear though is, you know, for those organizations that seriously want to get better at what they do, is how to go about it. There really has no been research on this, and this is why I come back to the research we're doing at the center, is to look at the organizational excellence architecture. Therefore, what sort of structure do you need to put in place inside your organization you know, to make improvement happen as assessed against these business excellence frameworks? Uh, many years ago, there was uh, a study on this, but it, it wasn't that intensive. And I was responsible for this research and through working with the Asian Productivity Organization. And we had five countries involved in this research. And you can see here the red bars and the blue bars. The red bars indicate those organizations which are highly mature in terms of business excellence, and therefore they've won business excellence awards and the blue bars are less advanced organizations. And then we can see down here the practices that they have in place, and they are distinctly different. So for instance, organizations which are business excellence award winners would have the majority of their staff trained in business excellence and they would understand excellence. Um, similarly with the senior management, they would understand uh, business excellence in depth. Uh, they would undertake um, internal business excellence self-assessment. So they'll undertake internal assessments every single year to measure their improvement. They'd also undertake external business excellence, business excellence assessments periodically so they can get that independent uh, viewpoint of where they stand in terms of excellence. Um, they would 
uh, also have category leaders so that have people responsible for each category category of excellence so therefore you would have somebody responsible for the leadership category the hr category the customer focus category etc and they would be responsible for ensuring that the strengths and opportunities for improvement are addressed and action plans are put in place in addition to that they'd have improvement teams supporting them to make sure and you know this happens and that team will uh, assist that category leader. So I'm not going to go through all of these, but you can see that organisations which do well in terms of excellence and therefore are more competitive, um, using the government's money more effectively with greater impact, you know, I, I, I say are doing something a little bit different. So really, this is what that this research is all about: is finding out what the organisational excellence architecture is and investigating it in more detail. And so we're looking at um, the structure that supports excellence, therefore whether or not organisations use a steering committee, um, maybe they use uh, what's called a business excellence council, maybe they have uh, multiple teams inside their organisation supporting the excellence drive. Uh, maybe they just have one person who's ultimately responsible. We don't know. So it's trying to investigate this in terms of, for instance, the structure and whether indeed they have a department or not for business excellence. And then we're also looking at additional resources that they have in terms of the amount of perhaps financial resources they use, which can be used for training, et cetera. Or it might be uh, whether or not they use outside consultants to assist them on the journey. So it's looking at what, what resource is available to, to assist that business excellence effort. In addition to that, we're examining the processes they have in place. Therefore, how do they communicate about business excellence internally? Who does it? How is it done? Do they have a recognition process to uh, encourage people to understand, learn and, and a practice business excellence inside the organization? And finally, we're looking at the assessment tools that are used, whether they use internal assessments and what type of internal assessments they use and how often and do they use external assessments and whether or not they're all award assessments or they're getting uh, just external sort of input from uh, consultants. So this is quite quite important research and I'm sure it'll be very, uh, I know that uh, the Development Academy of the Philippines are, are still supporting the business excellence drive inside the government. So this will really provide a, a clearer, I, I guess, understanding of how to achieve business excellence in the longer term. So for this research, we've just really kicked off the research and uh, We've just launched a survey as of last week, and so I'll be requesting the support of the Development Academy of the Philippines to encourage all government organisations who are familiar with excellence and using the excellence principles in the business to complete uh, this, this survey. Um, so we've got uh, maybe over 50 countries around the world supporting this and uh, through the Global Excellence Model Council. And uh, we're most interested to have the Philippines uh, participate in this. One of the things that's important in terms of uh, business excellence is, I guess, uh, you know, what, what's your starting point in, in, in the journey? So as an example of one of the questions that we have in the survey, it's this one shown here. This is just one example. It's looking at whether the organizational excellence architecture needs to be different dependent on your starting point, which is your level of business excellence maturity, or the size of the organization, or the industry type, or the speed with which you want to implement business excellence. So that's just one example of the questions. But to find out more, then please go to our website, the bpr.com. Uh, hopefully as well, uh, you'll have access to my slides afterwards and you can see the the blog, it's, it's difficult to copy it because it's so much detail, but all you need to do is go to my website, the bpir.com, which is shown here, bpir.com, and um, one of the latest news articles will be discussing the research and share more information, and there's a survey to download straight away. Secondly, the, the area that I want to talk to you about is, is on the benchmarking side, because for any organisation to improve, particularly at a fast rate, to quickly to, to learn. As we've seen through, you know, um, the countries around the world try to address a COVID pandemic, they're using benchmarking all the time. And so if for any organisation, irrespective of the challenges you face, the fastest way to learn 
is through um, um, benchmarking. And uh, I founded this methodology many, many years ago called the Trade Best Practice Benchmarking Methodology, which is used uh, uh, in many countries around the world now. It's the only benchmarking methodology with a certification scheme, and uh, it's also uh, endorsed by the Global Benchmarking Network. It's a very simple benchmarking method methodology designed to assist you to identify and implement best practices. And indeed, um, many of the winners, certainly the finalists, have uh, used, uh, be, are users of the trade best practice benchmarking methodology. And so similarly, if you'd like to win the Philippines uh, you know, government best practice uh, award, um, uh, again, this would stand you in, in very good stead indeed. Um, so this methodology is, is, it just consists of five stages. It's really helping you to address any challenge or problem you have inside your organization. And first of all, you develop a terms of reference, which will outline the project and you, you'd form a team. Then you review the current situation so you understand the problem in, in depth, in detail. And then you would go out and try and learn best practices from other organizations, deploy them, and then evaluate the outcomes. And it's called trade because it's all about trading information and knowledge with other organizations um, to um, help you to learn best practices and share with them too, so that uh, it's more of a partnership um, when, when, you're, when you're learning. Um, I think what's often not understood, and it is absolutely critical, the reason why I say this is such a powerful approach to change, probably the most powerful technique there is, is because it takes a group of people on a learning journey. Normally you'd have a project team doing the benchmarking. So you'd form a team around a particular problem or issue you're facing inside the organization. And that team would go out on a learning journey, finding out where you are now, where you need to be by learning from best practices. And not only that, normally your benchmarking team would involve other stakeholders who are responsible for the process or affected by the process. So normally you take quite, actually quite a large group of people on this learning journey. And, if, and in that learning journey, you will, um, you, you, the team will come up with many ideas itself on how to address the problem. As soon as, as soon as you ever write a problem down on a piece of paper, straight away, somebody will come up with an idea on how to solve that problem. You know, even at a first meeting of a benchmarking project. And, and, and this is what benchmarking is. It's not just about learning from the best practices of other organizations. It's providing you with a vehicle to also um, share, learn, you know, and share and create your own ideas and, and and this is why it's also a good idea to involve your stakeholders. So throughout the project, you're coming up with good ideas, your stakeholders are coming up with ideas, and that's su supplemented by the best practices you find from other organizations. And indeed, because benchmarking is outwardly focused, you're often going to organizations that you'd never normally go to. And apart from the best practices that you find, which will be hugely valuable if you've done your homework correctly, it will really give you a more creative mindset. So as soon as you start looking outside your comfort zone, normally it'll help you to come up with more creative ideas. So most benchmarking projects would generate between 50 to 120 ideas and practice, every single benchmarking project. And, 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 and then a the situation then is to decide which ones of these are gonna have the biggest impact and be easiest to implement. So then you sift through all those ideas and practices and decide which ones to implement. And the reason why I say this is also more powerful than any other change management technique is that, you know, potentially you could get consultants in to provide ideas or give you solutions, but then you won't have necessarily the, the, the understanding or the buy-in of your staff. Here, with the benchmarking, you're going on a learning journey. So you understand the problem. You understand the solution because you've been part of it. So everybody will then agree with that solution. And so that change becomes much more easy. So with, so with benchmarking, it helps you to generate really the next practices from learning for best practices and adding your creativity to them. Um, I've been doing a lot of work in the United Arab Emirates in, in recent years and, uh, particularly in, in Dubai. 
And so since 2015, I facilitated 34 benchmarking pro projects for the Dubai government. And some of these are really super important projects. Some of the ones are sort of addressing, I guess, smaller issues, but it's still important to those particular government entities. So like a large important project would be trying to reduce or, or, or trying to, sorry, increase the survival rate from um, a cardiac arrest. So this is a project for the Dubai Health Authority. In most countries, the survival rate from a heart attack is between uh, five to 10%. So and that'll, so that'll be the case in the Philippines, I'm sure. But in some countries like Copenhagen or cities like Copenhagen and Seattle, the survival rate after having a heart attack is 65%. And Dubai wants to become number one in the world for everything. And so they want to have, you know, a higher survival rate from a heart attack than, than, um, than, than, than those, those two cities. So their benchmarking project is, 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 is focused on that, increasing the survival rate from the heart attack. And so that's been a really intensive project uh, over, over uh, the last year. They won't achieve that outcome in in, in one year. So their objective is to, is to cheat, to, to have a higher survival rate than those cities by 2025. But uh, they've developed a, 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 a roadmap now based on a really intensive study of best practices from all around the world um, to, to actually um, to, to deliver that. Uh, other projects might be more simple projects, looking at employer happiness, uh, looking at uh, introducing innovation inside the organization, moving towards a smart government, as we've heard from the presentations in, in the Philippines um, today. But uh, these projects are absolutely fantastic. And we, we monitor their, their outcomes. And uh, on average, when we do, we, we start uh, a series of projects at the same time. So every, generally every year we do a, what's called the Dubai We Learn program, where we have 10 to 15 benchmarking projects starting at the same time, all got their own particular challenges. And we, we start with the training and they become trained in, in benchmarking. And then we provide a, a lot of support to all of those project teams. And this is just shown sort of on this slide here. So. Um, we provide them with a, a benchmarking project management system. Um, we support them with uh, best practice research. Uh, we have regular what's called knowledge sharing summits where all the organizations come together uh, to, um, to share their progress with the projects, what they've learned so far. Because the, the, the trade methodology becomes a, a common language so they can also understand where they are, or, are all at in terms of their project. And at the end of the year, we assess what each project has achieved. And we assess those projects in terms of whether they're a world-class project or, or not. So, the, and this is all part of the certification scheme. In fact, they're, they're assessed on a seven-star system. And then we produce a book of all the, all the actual projects themselves. So we develop this really set of best practices stemming from each project. So just to give you a snapshot, this is like like um, uh, the the terms of sorry, this is this is like the terms of reference for a project. Very simple, showing the aim, the scope of the project, the background, the objectives. You know, this and the part of the project management system. We have multiple worksheets that they go through to help them help them. Um, uh, undertake the project in a, in a professional manner and they use sort of many different quality management tools and techniques to understand for instance the current current challenges that, that they're facing so they use things like fishbone diagrams etc and then they use maturity metrics to assess other organizations best practices so it's quite a, a sophisticated system just to give you a, a brief idea on on um, what happens at these knowledge sharing summits when all the teams come together. I'll just play with you. I think it's a 30 second video.
Okay. So the, the last cycle of projects we finished was in December 2019, and uh, we had uh, three seven-star projects at that point in time, and um, four, five to six-star projects. And you can see see what the, 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 the titles of the projects are here, and, and the rest were three to four-star projects, which all, all of this is absolutely amazing achievement because the project was just nine months in total for this particular year because Dubai Expo was supposed to be starting in, in 2020. So it's quite a confined, confined program. Um, in total from, from all these projects, the savings were well over um, 100 million uh, uh, dirhams, which is something well over, well, I think over in, maybe in US dollars, it's about over 40, 40 million US dollars saved in, in, in a year for, for all the government projects. Uh, that's savings directly for the actual government departments or for the citizens in terms of their, their time. For instance, if you're, as we saw before, introducing something like a one-stop shop, then the benefits are for the citizens, saving them time perhaps from you know multiple visits to, to get um, um, a particular service and time costs money. So that should always be factored in. Uh, but the details of all these projects are actually shown in, in the books that we produce. So we've got some books and you can see these benchmarking projects, how they did them and, and the benefits from them. Uh, the book from two, that we did, the, the work from 2019 that was completed in December, the book for that will be um, completed in, in next, next month. So these are from the first two cycles, these books, but uh, the other one will come out soon if you want to read more about for instance the dubai health authority project on um reducing the, sorry increasing survival rate from cardiac arrest um the the last thing i i, I want to share with you is is because initially we we're not going to have a, another dubai we learn cycle of projects in 2020 because of the dubai expo and all government resources would be focused on that but the situation changed, obviously, because of COVID. And um, I had a, a phone call from the Dubai government sort of in April, and they're saying, look, you know, with this COVID pandemic, you know, we want to make sure we have the best response possible to it. And they, they said, because they know the power of the, you know, using benchmarking, we want to make sure we have the best response possible as a government to the COVID pandemic. And uh, they said, you know, can we facilitate a benchmarking project to manage and recover from the, from the coronavirus pandemic in, in Dubai? And they said, because of the urgency of the matter, it was extremely urgent, obviously, in, in around February, March, April, because nobody understood the virus or, you know, what's ex exactly would, would it be, be its impact. And so the, the urgency was to do a benchmarking project within a month. So that is very challenging in itself to do an in-depth benchmarking project where all the information is, is very new all the time from wherever you are in the world. Um, but because of the urgency of, the, the urgency of this, we obviously this was of paramount importance. And we said, really, if you want good results from this, we want to make sure we have all team members who are part of this project from seven star projects. Therefore, they've got experience of using trade and they've been involved in a, you know, a role model world class project in, in, in the past. And so we, so we went through the terms of reference stage. We, we, we selected the team and uh, we developed um, a terms of reference as shown here. And this was just, just got objectives for each stage of trade here. Uh, but straight away, when we started looking at uh, th th this particular problem, and this is what happens in the review stage of trade, uh, we realized we couldn't tackle this problem with one benchmarking team. We need five benchmarking teams. We need one team for crisis management, one for health, one for food security, one for eco e um, economic recovery, and one for societal behavior. So we then quickly form five benchmarking teams. And the other thing is that even waiting a month for the best practices from this project would be too long. If you find something really important, the Dubai government would want to hear it straight away. So the focus, and this is what we've done in the past as well, is, is as well as trying to find best practices that will ultimately go in your final report, and often these are sort of the big best practices for change management, uh, whenever you pick up some really useful 
uh, practices along the way, uh, then they should be shared and we call them quick wins. So every week, you know, or even more often that, um, any quick wins would be, sh be shared with the Crisis and Disaster Management Committee uh, by our team lead, by the overall team leader, um, to, to make sure that they, they can um, utilize the information straight away. So the review stage enabled us to identify, you know, those five five major areas to focus on, and and once, uh, but, but then they need to be analyzed in in more more depth. So for each area, you'd need to review it in detail to understand exactly where the UAE sat inside that area, what exactly was were the challenges. So uh, the teams would use things like SWOT analysis, fishbone analysis. So you can see this is a fishbone. This is undertaken by the crisis management team. So crisis management was one of the areas to focus on. And you can see the fish, the, the fish eating a coronavirus because this is what we wanted to achieve. And within the crisis management area, they identified five key areas, which are the bones of the fish, that they thought were the, the main challenges, which are things like crisis leadership, media control, data management, future foresight, readiness, communication channels. And then they would do a gap analysis and say for each of those five areas, can it be broken down into more detail so they could specify exactly what the gaps are so that then they could sort of know what's, what best practices they were searching for. So this is what you do with a good benchmarking project. You make sure you fully understand the problem and you break down the problem into component parts so you know what you're looking for. And when, normally when you're looking for best practices, you're looking often outside the industry for really revolutionary you know, um, solutions to probably traditional problems. So the choir stage was then learning from around the world uh, solutions to, to these challenges. Uh, primarily this was desktop research, but also we had experts invited from other countries to give webinars. And we also had Skype interviews and you know, uh, Zoom interviews with various people um, around the world to learn from them. So this is, for instance, our desktop research, and it shows how we break down each area. So this is for the crisis management area that was broken down to those five areas. The one area of crisis leadership was then broken down even to more detail of the questions that we wanted answered. And then we'd do the desktop research and search for best practices. And these would then potentially become our partners or we'd learn from them. And so, for instance, one best practice was learning from the New Zealand government, which obviously had a very good response to the crisis, and in particular to learn from our prime minister in New Zealand, who's got great communication skills in, in, in communicating to everybody, you know, what to do in terms of the crisis and, and what actions were necessary. So they learned a lot from um, her, her particular approach. Um, and then following on from that, there was a deploy stage. Uh, over 200 best practices were identified and then they would be captured in a report as, and then delivered as a presentation directly back to the crisis uh, management team. Um, so this is, you know, the top team in, inside Dubai. And then, you know, after this, you know, the, the, the actual team, the crisis management team would implement um, not all the best practices, but uh, uh, many of them which they think were appropriate. and. Um, since then, we've then sort of captured all the learning from that whole sort of benchmarking exercise, which is done in such a short period of time. Uh, a book has been written on that, which will be published again very shortly. And also a report of all the international best practices has been published already, uh, which again, you can access from uh, the bpr.com website, or just send me an email. So it's a, a fantastic project, which shows the power of benchmarking uh, which will help you to uh, identify best practices. So thank you very much indeed. Hopefully that was informative and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Mann. I reckon that there will be a lot of interest in adopting the best practices presented today and the trade best practice benchmarking methodology can be used to learn from the best practices in the Philippine public sector. I do hope that some of the agencies representatives present with us today decide to benchmark some of the GBPR's recognized best practices. 
So the floor is now open for questions. The links from Dr. Mann's presentation will be shared with the audience later. So uh, we shall first entertain questions for uh, the presentation of Dr. Mann. I think we already received one question here from Evangeline Dakanai. Some of the best practices presented may be adopted by other agencies. Is it possible to have a copy of the best practices presented? Oh yeah, um, I think this can be answered by the project manager. Miss uh, Melanie Mercader. Can we give them copies? Um, actually, the, the presentation is available in YouTube, so you can just watch it over and over again. So we will still uh, have to ask permission from the presenters if they are willing to share the presentation. Thank you. All right, there we go. So uh, we, you can always, again, as mentioned earlier, we are live on YouTube, so you can always uh, replay this video whenever you want. All right, so any questions for Dr. Mann's uh, presentation? And you can also send in questions for UP Diliman, DOST 9, because uh, they weren't able to receive questions from earlier. How about contingencies? This is a question from Geoffrey Serbolias. Um, can you expound on the question, sir? What about contingencies? Contingencies for what? <laughs> Yeah, I, I think the question was uh, maybe perhaps cut. So I'm let's muted. wait hello? further. Hello, hello, hello. Yes, Sir Geoffrey. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, because uh, for uh, for certain projects, uh, since we do not have all the answers, sometimes how do we make contingencies for that? Hello. Hello. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, Doc. Uh, uh, I just I want to ask uh, the question about uh, you know sometimes we don't have all the answers in a project and uh, since we have all the best practices and that will feed of course to uh, say for our knowledge uh, base management uh, which uh, will uh, give us uh, um, an, an intellectual capital but uh, how about the uh, how about project contingencies a project uh, that will fit to km uh, contingencies that uh, for the, for the things that we don't have uh, uh, know how yeah, but this is why you know benchmarking is a fantastic approach and um, what you do as, as i said is you develop a terms of reference which would describe your your the particular project you're you're interested in and as part of that overall approach, it's, 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 it's you know, quite systematic. So you would make sure when you set up the project that everybody understands it, you'd have a team involved, uh, you'd agree what the aim is, et cetera. Um, you'd also you know, manage the risks of the project as well. So you'd identify what risks uh, are potentially gonna impact the project. But, but usually the, actually the, the, the main risk is whether or not your team can spend enough time on the project itself rather than um, any risk associated with not finding um, any practices or ideas that are relevant to you. I think once a team follows a systematic approach, as for instance, through the trade methodology, then there's never been what you call an unsuccessful project because as I say you're, you're involving your team members, you're involving stakeholders for their inputs, you're learning from other organizations. And, you know, normally for any project, you're not looking for one sort of magic bullet or one practice that's going to totally revolutionize your organization. Normally it's a combination of very small practices that once you combine them together, 
then that will produce sort of the big breakthrough for your own organization. And so this is, you know, typically, as, as I said, most projects would identify on average or every single project that I showed you, those 35 ones in Dubai, the minimum amount of ideas or practices identified would be 50. That'd be the minimum, every single project. And this is why you can guarantee substantial improvements. And, um, but, but again, if you feel at any point in time, you're not going to be successful with a project, then the methodology, as part of the methodology, it would be saying, saying that before you start the next stage, are you still comfortable with the direction of the project? If not, you would either go back and revise the terms of reference or you'd stop the project. So you'd never go through the whole methodology without getting a successful uh, outcome. So, so it's really building into the methodology, you know, the, um, an approach which reduces the risk, which is really going to guarantee success. Thank you, Dr. Mann. We have a question from Mel Greg Concepcion. Can Dr. Mann provide us again the link for the Dubai We Learn program and be permitted to have a copy by downloading it? Is that allowed, sir? Uh, yeah, I was just trying to... Uh, yeah, I was actually just going to send my PDF now, and it'll have. Uh, I just I just made a PDF, so yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna add it okay. to the chat. I'm gonna add it to the chat box in the in the chat box in the next next couple of minutes. All right, no problem. And then follow up question: Is the trade frame uh, is does the trade framework allow? or follow any relevant researches made before in any management or leaders, leadership manuscript? Well, it's, 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 it's the only uh, benchmarking methodology that is certified by the Global Benchmarking Network and uh, it's been developed after over 20 years of use of that particular me methodology uh, it's endorsed by Dr. Robert Camp, who was the, 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 the first guy who introduced uh, benchmarking into Xerox. So um, I, I don't think you'd go wrong using it, but you can try it and have a look at it, compare it to other methodologies. And if you go to our website, there's lots of information about it, free information and um, academic papers on it as well. So um, it's all available. In fact, we produced an academic paper published last week, which was showing how Fonterra, New Zealand's largest company, uh, one of the biggest uh, dairy producers in the world, how they use the trade, method, trade benchmarking methodology. All right, gotcha. Now, I think we have a comment from Evangeline Dakana. She says that contingencies can be placed in the provisional costs of the project and the provisional costs are costs not being seen. So I think it has something to do with the first question. But anyway, it was uh, answered. So uh, thank you, Dr. Mann, for, for answering all of these questions. I don't think that we have any more questions from the audience, but okay. if we do get more, we shall, is it okay to email you uh, some of the questions if we have follow-up questions? Yes, and uh, once again, thank you very much for the opportunity to present and uh, I wish you every success moving forward and more participants in future in sharing their best practices. And uh, now that I'm free, in the next two minutes, I will add my file to the chat box and then I'll leave you. So thank you very much indeed. All right, thank you very much also. And uh, now we have another question for, for the other, pan, uh, other presenters from the earlier uh, presentations. This is, uh, this goes to LGU Muntinlupa, LGU Paranaque, UP Diliman, and DOSC9. If you are still here with us, we have a question here. Aside from get, uh, integrating technology innovation and speedy delivery services to address the stakeholders' needs, what could be other challenges faced by you and um, that could help further enhance uh, good governance and sustainability in your time frame and funding from the national government budget sectors? 
also in addressing extreme poverty of the Filipinos during the pandemic. I'm not sure how that is related, um, but uh, go ahead. If, if we have any answers from the previous presenters, have you encountered any other challenges during the pandemic? How about uh, UP Diliman? Are you here with us? Hi, good afternoon, Elit. Yes, uh, good afternoon, po. To answer the question, ma'am, uh, I think um, one of the challenges na, uh, na experience namin is um, uh, yung internet connection. So I think mm -hmm. we really need to invest and choose the telco company who can give us the best and strong connectivity so as uh, we can really cope up cope with the uh, e-government platform all right i agree uh internet connectivity has been uh, quite a problem especially that we do uh work uh, remote work or we work from home even in the public sector so how about the others uh do we can we hear from LGU Muntinlupa, are you still with us? Yes. Um, to answer the question you know, regarding the challenges faced by, by implementing our best practice, I think it's the acceptance of the public. Because, syempre, whenever we implement a new platform, you know, kailangan masanay. So the public has to be, uh, kailangan masanay. And at the end, the money public, uh, ni uh, service provider, Kailangan natin is to improve and to perfect and to make it work new system. So, kailangan ng continual improvement. Tapos, um, I think the mention din ito kanina ni Asik Magsino is the continuity. This is a sad reality kasi in uh, local government units, you know, with a change of administration, not unless the, uh, the next administration is kasing proactive nung kanyang sinundana. Uh, he or she is willing to support your program. So, yun, continuity and your policy for, yeah. for LGUs. Thank you. That was a good answer. Uh, we, we do have difficulty with uh, acceptance because uh, especially now that we are moving towards a, digital, a more digital world, some of our um, constituents are having a little bit of difficulty in adjusting with uh, that new, the new platforms that we have to use. So that's a good point. Um, if we still have other presenters, like maybe uh, ARD, uh, ARD Salazar from DOST9, perhaps you can share with us some of the challenges that you have faced. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Sir Concepcion, yung question nyo po ay parang pang universe. <laughs> but uh, aside from the uh, technology innovations, I I'd like to tell you, as what the other presenter mentioned, that the technology innovation itself is a challenge. No? Uh, because we have to improve our IT infrastructure and to lower the cost of services, especially in the provinces. Talagang mahina. Uh, you can never compete. No? Uh, if, if, if a country is to compete by the speed of its internet connection, talo na tayo. So I think that's one of the uh, area where the government should uh, put or invest in. And another one is, I think, uh, we have a program called Industry uh, 4.0, where we are to support uh, small, medium, micro, small, medium enterprises to automate their, their uh, processing or manufacturing services. No? So I think uh, that is also where government should, should put their money so that we can ele elevate the level of our micro enterprises to at least uh, small to medium thus uh, creating jobs and addressing somehow some poverty issues thank you thank you ard salazar that answers the question of poverty 
And I do agree that the question is a little bit uh, pang Miss Universe, but you you were all uh, very uh, good in answering the question. So perhaps pang Miss Universe din po kayo, ma'am. All right. So uh, I think that's er uh, everything that we have today. So if there are any follow-up questions, uh, we will just email our uh, speakers and presenters. And then uh, we will just email blast the answers afterwards. From the bottom of our hearts, we, we really would like to thank all of you for your participation in the uh, GBPR 2020 forum and for sending in all of your insightful questions. We will issue e-certificates of appreciation for speakers and presenters. And uh, likewise, we shall issue certificates of appearance for the participants later. And now the forum has come to an end. I would like to call on the Vice President of the Productivity and Development Center, Mr. Arnel Diabanto, to give us the closing remarks. Thank you, Kate. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear, sir. Okay, thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And I'm very happy to uh, see our speakers and presenters this afternoon. I'm pleased to note uh, SEC uh, Clarito Toto Magsino, Ma'am Elena Landan Cruz, and Dr. Robin Mann, our mentor on uh, uh, Business Excellence uh, Program. Thank you very much for sharing your insights and expertise to everyone here. And I also would like to uh, express our sincere appreciation uh, to the city government of Muntinlupa, the city government of Paranaque, uh, the Department of Science and Technology and the University of the Philippines who extended their and shared their best practices uh, this afternoon. We hope that uh, you will continue to welcome other organizations that would want to benchmark with your organization on your best practices. So to our attendees uh, this afternoon, we are very delighted with your interest and participation in this forum. Uh, we not only want to encourage you to come up with your own uh, best practices uh, for your own uh, organization, but also to adapt and uh, learn from the best practices of other organizations. As, your, as our senior vice president uh, Mendoza mentioned earlier, you may refer to our Center of Excellence in Public Sector Productivity Knowledge Bank for information on best practices from both the public and private sectors that may be appropriate for you to adapt in your organization to improve your own uh, processes and in turn, enhance the public uh, service delivery. We are actually searching for benchmark uh, information in the government uh, that uh, may be drawn from your practices, and this would like to uh, be part of the Knowledge Bank uh, to make this available to every government uh, agency. So uh, the Knowledge Bank is intended to help you determine uh, the public sector organizations that you may uh, benchmark from. So for this afternoon, our speakers have emphasized the importance of innovation, benchmarking, productivity, and agility, not only under the new normal, but in helping, in helping us respond to emergency situations, thus making our organizations more prepared for the future. So the, this best practice forum has uh, provided us opportunity uh, for knowledge sharing, uh, in the public sector so we can uh, further extend our reach to more agencies and to encourage the development of communities of practice on best practices and develop the culture of information and knowledge uh, sharing. Uh, hopefully this would accelerate and effectively deliver uh, government services to the public. Well, it is normal for all of us to get excited, to be given the opportunity to learn from the best practices of others, to share of best practices, and to be recognized for our best practices. But 
let us not uh, forget the importance of sharing information and knowledge with other agencies, not only to help minimize the burden of asking the transacting public to uh, obtain such information from us to meet the other agencies' information requirements as demonstrated by our presenters. But more importantly, and I'd like to emphasize this, to, for us to deliver meaningful and beneficial services to every Filipino. With your continued interest and willingness to learn uh, and share best practices, it is our high hope that uh, activities such as this may serve as an impetus for or to enhance your own practices, adapt the ones that uh, you have discovered today and will learn of in the future towards bringing our government closer to every Filipinos. So for those of you who are achieving better results out of your existing practices, we encourage you to submit uh, your best practices for next year's uh, government best practice recognition cycle. For now, we are still uh, accepting entries for the GBPR for COVID-19 response, as repeatedly announced. Uh, this is a spin-off project that aims to capture, disseminate, and promote replication of important COVID-19 best practices by our public sector organizations to ensure that the learning and innovations developed by our agencies during this time of crisis are captured, documented, and shared. Uh, this is to support future uh, studies and policy implementation for similar disasters, disaster events of local or national uh, magnitudes. For related information, please uh, refer to our official uh, Facebook pages for more details. As we conclude uh, this afternoon's forum and as we approach the year end, we also would like to announce that uh, this uh, best practice forum is one of the activities of the government best practice recognition, as we are all aware of. Annually, since 2015, the Academy has been uh, inviting public sector organizations to submit uh, best practice, practice entries, and we're, we're very glad to highlight the, the entries that we're receiving every year has been increasing tremendously. Again, I would like to encourage you to uh, uh, participate uh, in the succeeding rounds of this uh, uh, government best practice uh, recognition. You still have ample time to write your practices and be recognized uh, accordingly. At this juncture, let me invite you to attend our annual public sector quality and productivity improvement forum tomorrow wherein select experts and practitioners will also be sharing their experiences to promote collaborations towards making your quality management systems more effective and responsive to any unexpected circumstances. Also, I would like to inform you that the GBPR 2021 project cycle will commence in January. Thus, your submission of best practice entries will be much appreciated. Let us continue to observe the sharing of best practices and disseminate the knowledge that will enrich our public service delivery. With that said, I wish everybody a pleasant afternoon and happy holidays, happy new year, stay safe, stay safe. magandang hapon po at maraming maraming salamat po sa inyong lahat. Thank you very much, VP Abanto. Now let me take this opportunity to invite everyone to turn on your cameras. I know that uh, we are unable to conduct this uh, forum face-to-face, -face, but at least we get to have uh, an online documentation. So please go ahead and turn on your cameras so then we, uh, we can conduct a quick picture taking. All right, do I see everyone? Please go ahead and turn on your cameras. Okay, so we will be having three shots for this one. Okay, so I'll count one to three and then do another two rounds. Okay, so one, two, three. All right.
got that one. And then let's do another one. One, two, and three. Perfect. Last one. Okay, so that's one, two, three. Smile. All right. So that's it, everyone. It ends our GBPR 2020 forum. And thank you once again for attending. Uh, I would like to encourage everyone here to submit uh, your GBPR on COVID-19 response. Entries, uh, we are still open for submissions until December 20. Once again, I'm your host. I'm Kate Tool, and this is the Government Best Practice Recognition 2020 Forum on E-Governance, Delivering Efficient Services to the People in the New Normal. Thank you for attending and stay safe, everyone. Happy Holidays.